Good morning and welcome to the 2022 Global Food Allergy Summit. I'm Tanya Winders, the president and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, as well as the president of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to day two of the Global Food Allergy Summit 2022. Um, we are going to do a brief just sort of recap and appreciation of you all who participated yesterday, but also a reminder of some of the topics that we discussed yesterday. So yesterday we focused really on the medical management of food allergy, including prevention, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and some self-management tips and techniques. Today, however, we're gonna turn the focus really to strategies on living with food allergies. So for those of you who have joined us from all across the globe, um, over 800 strong in our registration community, um, we are so thankful that you're here and we hope that you get some really pragmatic, practical tips to living with food allergies today. Now, yesterday I challenged each speaker, and I'll do the same today. When you come up, share a little bit about your why, right? We like to start with why. What is the, the real motivation and the purpose for coming around this community table today, um, all around the world, but certainly those of us who are here live and those that are online, um, and spending your weekend thinking about food allergy and how we continue to provide hope and inspiration for the hundreds of millions across the world that are living with this condition. Um, we talked yesterday about how far we have come in these areas of prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management. And today will not um, be second to that. We will talk about some of the things that are on the horizon. We'll talk about some of the strategies that um, individuals have found are most effective for things like dining out, and for transitioning to college, for reading labels, for you know all of these various ages and stages of life that we as food allergic patients and food allergic families encounter and go through. And so we're very excited about day two and the plan here. I wanna once again thank the partners and the partner organizations of the Global Food Therapy, Global Allergy Airways Patient Platform. And I also wanna thank our sponsors because without their support, certainly we could not conduct this event. So those sponsors of Amune, DBV, Genentech, and Novartis. What I will remind you all is that the sponsors do not have any influence really over the content or the speakers and what they say or don't say throughout these presentations. Uh, all of this is of independent thought, and it also is not intended to act as medical advice specifically for you. We are not here to diagnose or to uh, provide direct medical advice for any one individual on the line. What we're hoping is that you'll hear some things that maybe you can then take back to your allergist, to your provider, and have more fruitful conversations about living your best life with food allergies. So again, um, please, refrain from in the comments. We want your comments and questions, but refrain from offering any medical advice in that chat or question function. Once again, uh, today, as we turn the focus to strategies for living with food allergy, um, I'm going to be co-moderating and, and hosting alongside um, two individuals who I introduced yesterday, Dr. Doug Jones and Dr. Atul Shaw, who lead the global, global food therapy um, organization. And, and Dr. Shaw and Dr. Jones really have been such valuable partners to us in organizing this uh, summit and in the original concept. They are the two that had the original concept about bringing this community together, having these discussions in very pragmatic, real-world um, applications and, and approaches. And so very thankful for them once again today. Look forward to co-moderating as we get started. Now, how will we spend the balance of our time? Um, we have actually 10 sessions on the agenda. We'll uh, try to keep these very fast moving and like a TED Talk type of um, format with about 20 minutes per presentation, but we will address questions at the end of each session. So go ahead, log your questions in, we'll get to as many as possible. And we've also built in a couple of sessions just for your questions. So don't hesitate to ask anything, right? You've got the experts, the global experts at your fingertips today, and please don't hesitate to ask the questions that you really want and need answered. So we'll start with a presentation on ages and stages in food 
allergy treatment uh, by Dr. Jennifer Lebovich. Then we'll move into a very pragmatic travel and dining out with Kyle Dine, who um, is a social influencer and has done a lot of work in raising awareness about the importance of food allergies in, in traveling and dining out. Then we'll hear from Dr. Rushi Gupta on demystifying food labels. We know that this is, again, one of those daily challenges that so many of us at food allergic families encounter because labeling is not universal. Labeling is not um, the same, may contains doesn't mean may contains to everyone in the same way. And so um, Dr. Gupta will address some of that for us and bring clarity to those demystifying those food labels. Then in session four, we'll hear from Dr. Gia Rosenblum, who will actually focus on understanding the stress of food allergies and providing us some of the coping mechanisms, because this is a condition, a chronic condition, that absolutely has a lot of stress and psychosocial impact. Um, the anxiety of eating three times a day and addressing that um, is something that Dr. Rosenblum will really bring to bear for us. Then we'll have a Q&A period before I bring a topic around global issues and perspectives in food allergy and sort of how, as I said yesterday, we're moving from this dichotomy of, of almost a black and white avoidance or nothing food allergy space to a full color perspective with many different options when it comes to prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management. And then we'll round out our day with a topic from Dr. Atul Shah and Dr. Kamal Ramlal on bringing food allergy treatments to new places and new spaces and innovative approaches. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Jones around holistic abundance in living life with food allergy. And I think uh, just a really empowering uh, final session there. We'll have a little more time for questions, and then we will wrap up with just a summary and some reminder of trusted resources that are uh, available to support you in your journey. So we have a full four hours ahead of us, and I don't wanna delay any further, um, but I will just remind every speaker as you come up, share a little bit about your why, why you got into this space, why you're here before jumping into your key topic. And no better way to really kick that off than with our patient testimony this morning. Um, we talked about this yesterday, the importance of hearing directly from individuals living with food allergies and keeping that patient perspective front and center throughout our time together today. And today I am honored to have with us Rhea Jane. Rhea is um, a junior in high school who has lived with food allergies for most of her life and multiple food allergies. She'll tell you a little bit about her journey. But what I love is that Rhea is an empowered young woman who has a plan, um, who knows how to go about living her fullest life, even in light of her allergies, and who has used her diagnosis of food allergy to help and empower other people. She's actually written a series of books on different health topics, but this one specifically on the class that can food allergies. I know Rhea will talk a little bit about her journey and her decision to take her experience and, and empower and share with others. And so Rhea, I invite you to the podium and welcome you today. Hi everyone, uh, good morning. My name is Rhea Jain. Um, like she said, I'm 16 years old. Um, I'm a junior in Chicago, Illinois, and I can't eat nuts. Um, yeah, so when, when I was one, I was diagnosed with a peanut and Trina allergy um, after my brother was playing with me eating PB&J. And, um, and I broke out into hives and here we are. So um, I'm sort of here today to talk about my story, my experience, um, and my journey living with uh, this thing called food allergies. Um, so I sort of wanted to start out um, in elementary school. Um, so in elementary school, you're sort of told um, that there's this food you can't eat, and you're like, oh, okay, sounds good. I won't eat it. Um, I'll avoid it. And you don't fully understand it, right? So um, I found myself sitting at the allergen-free table for most of my life from pre-k through eighth grade i sat excluded um, in this little tucked away circular table um, in the lunchroom and it was very easy to feel left out um, to feel excluded um, i sort of felt like i didn't have the same childhood experience that um, all my other peers were having um, and even if i wanted to sit at the other table with all my other friends 
I was too scared. You know, there's this fear built inside of you when you're told that um, the worst thing that could possibly happen after you eat this food um, at such a young age, at five, six years old. Um, so it was very scary, but you always had your parents there for you, right? You had your parents holding your hand. Um, and then later you went to middle school and um, things get a little bit better. Um, I mean, I think in middle school, I developed a support system, right? So you sort of learn to advocate for your food allergies more in middle school. Um, and you learn what a food allergy is, you know, not just don't eat the food. Oh, why can't I eat the food? You know, why do I have this allergy? Um, which makes you understand it a little bit more, but maybe makes it a little bit even more fearful at times. Um, but in middle school, um, I found myself having the majority of my accidental exposures, my reactions, um, which made things really scary. Um, I found myself sometimes even being scared to be in the same room with my, my allergen. Um, I found myself, I remember at a wedding one time, there was this whole buffet of dessert and I was so excited just for the chef to tell me, oh, everything here has nuts. It was, it, was, it was horrifying, you know? I, I ran out of the room, I was crying. I, I, I didn't want anything to do with it, you know? I, I, just, wanted, I just wanted chocolate, <laughs> that's all I wanted. Um, but, but yeah, so you, you do become a better advocate in middle school, but it is challenging to start talking to your friends uh, about your allergy. Um, so then um, after I had developed that support system, I found myself starting over again at Square Run um, in high school because I went to a new high school than I did in middle school. Um, and all you want to do is make friends, right? All you want to do is fit in um, and, you know, just be like everyone else. Um, so in high school, um, I didn't want to introduce myself as, oh, hi, my name is Rhea, and oh, yeah, I, I can't eat nuts. You know, it's not the best conversation starter. Um, but it's important, you know, though it doesn't define you, it's, it's a part of you, and it's something that your friends should understand. And that support system and community is really what makes you feel safe in high school and anywhere you go. Um, but in high school, um, I did find myself becoming a better advocate for myself, right? You, you go to dinner without your parents, you go to parties with your friends, and they have to know to look out for you. And, but you also have to look out for yourself, right? Because then when you enter this next phase in college, you know, you're, you're going to have to look out for yourself. You have to be that advocate that you always dreamt of being. Um, and so that's why um, I started this initiative with uh, JJ called The Land of Can. Um, and that's why I wrote the class that canned food allergies. You know, we talk about this why. Why do, why do we do what we do? And I really think I, I feel really passionate about this because, you know, you do the best that you can with what you have um, and just make it better for the next generation. You know, I wish I had these resources when I was younger. Um, so all I can do now is make it better for those younger than me um, who have these allergies. Um, and we, it's not just food allergies, you know, everyone has something that they can't do, um, whether it's maybe you can't ride a bike or maybe you can't eat gluten or wheat or, uh, you know, anything, um, but that doesn't define you. So that's the message that I wanted to spread to kids. Um, and that's, that's why I do what I do. And I think with food allergies, I, I learned a lot about myself. You know, I think I became a better advocate one. And two, I think I gained a lot of empathy, you know, your whole life having this one desire of just everyone understanding your food allergy and not everyone does. So you learn to understand what other people are going through. You know, you learn to feel the pain that other people are going through as you wish that they felt for you. So with that, I want to say thank you. Um, and yeah. <laughs>
I mean, I think it, there's always this like anxiety of, you know, this, this new phase, this new journey. Um, it's like entering high school, you know, you're back at square one, you have to create your own support system once again. Um, so definitely in college, um, I think one thing we always talk about is, you know, the dining halls, you know, having a space where there's a whole allergen free center um, where you can feel safe, you know, meet with the dietitians, the chefs at the college. So I think that's definitely one of the biggest questions you ask, you know, I mean, there's all the other questions that you have, whatever you're interested in, majoring, all that. But the big thing is, you know, this thing that surrounds your whole world is, is food allergies. So it's, it's definitely something that you have to take into account and, you know, learn to live with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again. Great job. Really appreciate you sharing. And you can see why, um, you know, in thinking about what is that patient testimony that that takes us through the ages and stages and life of food allergies, why I asked Rhea to come and share um, her experience. Because even though, as she said, she's lived with this, she's managed it, it doesn't define her. And, and she's got so many other hopes and dreams and who knows what the future holds. Um, she has an interest in politics, so I'm trying to get her to come to DC and spend some time with the network. Um, but yeah, I think she will do just fine at whatever she decides to pursue. So today, as we turn to this focus of strategies for living with food allergy, again, I just wanna encourage you all to stay connected throughout the day, ask your questions, chime in. We'll get to as many of those as possible in due time with each presentation. And our very first presentation today, um, I'm going to invite Dr. Atul Shah to the podium to introduce um, our first presentation, Dr. Jennifer Lebovich. So Dr. Shah, would you join me? Thank you, Tanya. And absolutely wonderful uh, story, Ria. I think uh, all the families who are right now online, uh, they can relate to your story. So thank you for sharing. And more important, this conference is more about giving hope. So we need to move from fear to hope. And you began this morning that way. So thank you. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Jennifer Lebowitz. Uh, she's an assistant professor in psychology at Harvard Medical School and an attending psychologist in the division of immunology at Boston Children's Hospital. She provides psychological consultation for children and families related to coping with food allergy and other allergy conditions. Her research has focused on enhancing patient and family coping with and self-management food allergy and atopic dermatitis. So we have uh, recorded presentations for her and maybe we'll begin now. Hello, uh, my name is Jenny Lebovich. I am a psychologist in the food allergy program at Boston Children's Hospital, and I am very excited to be with you today as part of the Global Food Allergy Summit. And I will be talking today about ages and stages in food allergy treatment. And I do not have any relevant disclosures. So um, my goals today for our time together will be to review developmental aspects of children's coping with food allergy, to discuss strategies to teach children about food allergies, involve them in food allergy management, and build confidence um, at different developmental stages. And I'm also excited to share a little bit about um, a project I was involved in coordinating developing age-based educational handouts for caregivers of children with food allergy. So I, I, I want to start with um, why is a developmental approach to managing uh, managing and coping with food allergy important? So I like to think about this as sort of the intersection of food allergy management and child development. So we know that there are consistent pillars of food allergy management that we have to think about across all ages, allergen avoidance, preparedness to manage or to recognize and manage a reaction. And we know that there are changes, predictable changes in food allergy concerns as children mature. So this may include, you know, different safety issues for say a toddler or an adolescent with food allergy, uh, psychosocial issues that might emerge as children are more aware of differences because of allergies, or perhaps more aware of risks, um, changes in children's cognitive understanding of food allergy, and different roles for the child in self-management and they're in their own self-management as their capabilities and understandings change changes so 
we know that families feel like they need some sort of a roadmap for food allergy management as the child gets older, and that ongoing tailored education is important. So when I'm working with families, um, I like to think about taking a gradual and team-based approach to building children's skills and knowledge over time. So that the goal is that we can start early in a way that makes sense for the child. So that by the time that they are out on their own managing food allergies, this is a manage, this is a matter of routine for them. And we know that this approach can increase their safety, decrease anxiety, and increase confidence. So we, when we think about um, involving kids and teaching them about their food allergies, I often use a framework in terms of thinking about promoting balanced coping with food allergies. So often families will say at the start of a visit, um, you know, I want my child to take food allergies seriously. I don't want them to take risks, but I also don't want them to be fearful. Or I want my child to be safe, but I also want them to be socially included and participate in typical daily activities that other kids their age participate in. And so we often talk about balanced coping with food allergy as having a goal of teaching kids to manage food allergies and take them seriously without excessive anxiety or over avoidance of social activities or other activities. So how do we do this? So first of all, you know, children take their cues from adults' behavior and words. So when parents and other adults and caregivers um, give the message that food allergy is manageable, kids will pick up on this. Um, and so we think about educating based on consistent safety routines versus fear. Um, and so what does this look like? For young kids, think about the way you might educate about other things, like looking both ways before we cross the street. Um, the focus is on the routine. It's it's important, we always do it, but we're not focused on bad outcomes. Um, and we can also be aware of language we're using and educating about food allergy. There are things like words we might hear like, like threatening food allergies or a fatal reaction, which may be important in certain contexts, but can certainly give a message of fear. For kids. Um, we want to give kids in information that's clear and easy for them to understand. Um, and we'll talk about that in upcoming slides in the context of their stage of development. And we want to think about educating them and updating that education as they get older. Um, we want to think about collaborating with your allergist or healthcare provider that's managing the child's food allergies. So it can be really hard to manage anxiety and stay safe when you don't have the facts. So if there are areas that you have questions or concerns about that your child does, collaborate with your healthcare provider. Um, and we want to encourage open communication. So we know kids will have questions. There may be challenges that come up, worries. We want them to know that you they can always come to their parents with questions. Um, um, and that you guys are in this together. And, and, and know that caregiver anxiety with developmental transitions is, is normal. So, you know, families develop routines that work well at home and there can be anxiety as kids transition to um, school or daycare or the child being taking a greater role in self-management. And with new routines will come uh, more, more confidence in those settings. So, Young children with food allergies, toddlers, preschoolers, at this age, kids require careful monitoring. Monitoring, They're active, they're curious. They're working on developing a sense of control and independence. They thrive on routines and they learn through imitation and play. So how do we build on this um, to teach kids about food allergies at this age? So first of all, parents as role models. So your child is watching what you do, even for young ones before you're formally teaching about food allergy, they'll do, do you, see you do things like read a label or make sure you have your bag with you um, with, with the emergency medicine every time you go out. And so kids are picking up on this and these daily routines provide a sense of security. So simple things that you do, like washing hands before eating, or if there's a certain place in the house that everyone eats their meals. Um, we can also think about simple safety focused language at this age. So that might be things like words like safe or, or not safe, or you know, this um, eggs can make you sick. These cookies don't have eggs, they're safe for you, for example. Um, we can also practice simple language with kids as they get older, enter the preschool years, for example, like, no, thank you, I have allergies. We can give kids simple choices to increase control because they want to have control at this age. So for example, you're going out to the park, you know, they 
they might not be able to eat what other kids are eating. Um, do they want to bring the apples or do they want to bring their crackers? We can also help kids label their family. So this is a big um, something parents of kids with young children are working on in general, giving them tools to label their emotions. You know, I know you felt frustrated or mad when you couldn't eat what your sister was eating, but you did a good job waiting. Let's get a snack that's safe for you. And we can also think, of, think about things like medical play to build familiarity and comfort in medical situations. This might be something like a practicing with a toy doctor's kit um, before going to a visit or for our older preschoolers, even with an auto injector trainer practicing with a stuffed animal just to introduce and build comfort. Um, our, our early school age children with food allergy can play a greater role in their own food allergy management. So this is an age that they are focused on learning, accomplishing things, they have greater impulse control, a better understanding of their allergies. Um, and they have, uh, they also have more time out of direct parental supervision, they're entering school, there's play dates, there's extracurriculars. Um, also, they may be greater, they may develop a greater awareness of differences from peers. And sometimes we think about this as the special to different transition. So no matter, you know, how great the special cupcake is that my mom packed for me, um, I kind of want to eat what the other kids are eating. So, so how do we support children at this age? First of all, we have a continued focus on those consistent management routines, and we also want to add some information about why they work and they're important. So, for example, you know, we read labels because we can't tell what's in it just by looking at the food, or we can't share food because we don't know if other people's food is safe for you. Or if you feel sick, you tell a grown up. We have medicine that help, can help you feel better. Or, the, or your EpiPen works quickly to help stop an allergic reaction. We can also help kids prepare for new situations. So, for example, what to expect. You know, in kindergarten, um, the cafeteria, th these things might look similar to how you had snack in preschool. These might things might look different. They all work well to keep you safe. Or knowing who are the go-to people at school or at a play date if they have questions, maybe visiting ahead of time. We can also gradually involve children in food allergy management tasks, of course, with adult supervision. So for example, kids at this age are in various, various stages of learning to read. Even kids who are just recognizing their letters, you might point out on a package, M-I-L-K, that spells milk. It makes it a bit concrete versus magical how you find this information about what's in a food. Um, we can also think about having them um, do things such as um, practice again with their auto injector. So for example, at this stage, um, they might think about practicing on a parent or on themselves, always with the knowledge that you would use that in an emergency, but we're we're uh, building building their confidence. Um, we can review routines for handling reactions, who that they would tell, and as we said, building comfort with things like um, like a trainer. Um, we can use role plays to practice language and skills. So, for example, how to explain why their food might look different at a party, why they're bringing something else. Um, and the importance of listening. So kids at this age, as we said, we may be more um, aware of differences from peers. And as parents, caregivers, adults, we might want to jump in and try to fix the problem to make it better. But sometimes the most important thing you can do is start by listening. So for example, um, validating their feelings. Like I knew it was hard. I know this was tough when you couldn't eat what the other kids were, you know, were having at the soccer game. But I love the way you let your coach know. Um, and then think about ways to problem solve for next time. Um, also, we know kids with food allergies can be at increased risk for teasing or bullying based on allergy related differences. The, the good news is that kids with food allergies, other kids are overall extremely supportive and at this age in particular want to be advocates and helpers. So we can think about things like teaching other kids with food allergy about food allergies at a young age, um, whether it be in the classroom or friends to know specifically what they can do to help. Um, 
for our late school age children or early adolescents, so maybe around the eight to 10 or 12 age range, um, these children are more, can be more involved in managing food allergies without adult support. Um, they are developing larger social circles, have increasing importance of the peer group. Um, we often see a transition to less structured environments, for example, move, moving away from allergen-free tables in the cafeteria. Um, they, we also may see a greater awareness of risks related to food allergy that can lead to more worry or vigilance. So for example, being more aware of the potential for reactions or that mistakes can happen, um, while also maybe not always fully understanding nuances around what's risky and what's not. So common concerns at this age, for example, or common misunderstandings might be that just being near a food or just smelling a food, um, or if someone just rubs up against them and they've eaten the food, that they might be at risk for a severe reaction. So how do we use this information to help support these kids? Um, first of all, building skills before they're out and on their own. This is a great time for partnering, um, working on some of these skills, giving them more of a role, but with parents, caregivers there for support. So for example, um, having a greater role in label reading, practicing field trips to the supermarket, involving kids for planning for social situations and language that they might use, for example, um, explaining to peers, like, I always have to tell the server um, about my allergies. It's just what I do. It, it helps keep me safe. Um, eating out, we can think about things like looking at menus online at home before you go to the restaurant to think about what you would ask, what you would think about, um, using role plays to practice language, or going together to visit common hangouts where peers might go on their own before children are going independently. Um, we can also use the anaphylaxis action plan to help guide teaching. So things like knowing how to recognize symptoms of an allergic reaction, um, thinking about what they would use, when they would treat with epinephrine, practice with a trainer, giving facts about epinephrine. So for example, that it's a safe medicine, that it works well to, and quickly to stop an allergic reaction. Um, and then that's why we always wanna keep it close by. I often find that this is a big fear for kids. Sometimes the needle is a fear. So helping them know that actually that needle on that auto injector is actually quite small. And I'll often share what other kids who have told me who might have had an allergic reaction, their experience that really, um, it actually part of it was empowering and knowing how quickly the medicine worked. Um, we can talk about how children can be safe if their allergens are present and clarify concerns if they have worries. And this is a really important piece for partnering with your allergist. So thinking about things like if the child is concerned about how can I be safe when I'm eating near other people, um, eating foods I'm allergic to, thinking about asking those questions in visits or involving your child in making a list for questions. Um, and also um, talking to your allergist if you're if you're finding that your child is um, avoiding foods or situations beyond what is medically necessary. For our adolescents with food allergies, we're really thinking towards that transition for greater independence for food allergy management. Um, we also can see at this age concerns about fitting in or feeling embarrassed due to food allergies. Teens I work with will often talk about just not wanting allergies to be a big deal or to stand out. We, this can sometimes lead to potential for risk-taking behaviors, particularly if teens are not feeling confident speaking up about allergies or carrying their auto injector in social situations. Or sometimes there might be risk if they don't feel like they feel confident understanding things like how or when to treat a reaction. There are also some new areas of concern at this stage. So for example, romantic relationships, there may be concerns about things like open mouth kissing and possibilities for cross contact. Also things like drugs and alcohol. So for example, um, how these might affect decision making, but also for example, um, that alcohol could contain allergens or that it could um, lead to a faster absorption or a more severe allergic reaction. So how do we use this information to help our teens with food allergy? Um, first of all, we think want to think about at this stage being clear about management expectations. Um, but also, so certain things are non-negotiable. We always have to know how to avoid allergens, find safe food, carry emergency medicine. However, you can collaborate with your teen on how to reach goals. So, so at this stage, they are doing more on their own, but they still need your support for planning, for problem solving. Those organizational skills are still developing. Um, 
making sure that teens understand and can use their anaphylaxis management plan. And again, at this stage, we want to know that they could treat a reaction if they were out on their own or thinking about things like friends knowing about their food allergies. Um, we want to be clear about management responsibilities. As teens are taking over more responsibilities, um, it's easy for families to have some ambiguity in who is taking care of what. So you want to talk about that. Again, anticipating and talking about handling new situations like dating, drugs, alcohol. We want to think about even though these situations can be awkward, you want the child's first experience with these conversations to be with you so that they feel prepared if they encounter these situations. You know, how to handle peer pressure to drink, how to handle those situations, or how to talk to a romantic partner about things like kissing, for example, or strategies that they might use to avoid uh, allergens in that situation. And those can be great things, again, to partner with your allergist to discuss. Um, and also as teens work towards um, being more involved in their medical care, in general, this is a great age to start to think about things like scheduling appointments, filling prescriptions, um, using uh, patient medical portals, and having some one-on-one -on -one time with the allergist. And of course, checking in and keeping the lines of communication open. Um, parental and adult support is still quite important. And so finally, I just really briefly wanted to share with you all that, uh, again, this opportunity that I had to be part of a team putting together age-based handouts, educational handouts for caregivers and patients with food allergy. And so this actually came out of a parent's comment to me when they were talking about the fact like that there's amazing information for managing and coping with food allergy online, but it can be hard to find information for their child's particular age and coping with some of the emotional strategy, uh, challenges that can go along with food allergy. So I had um, the good fortune to be part of a work group through the Quad AI, um, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, putting together um, these handouts. And this was a team of allergists and psychologists that I worked with. And we thought about what is important to families and what was important to our team in developing these handouts. Um, we know that families you know, are often looking for information. It can be hard to find reliable evidence-based information to know what to trust. We wanted to have that focus on balanced coping and really practical tips for integrating food allergy management into daily life. And we wanted these resources to be easily accessible to families and to healthcare providers. And so our process involved thinking about for developing our content and our format. Um, we use practice guidelines for food allergy management, published literature related to coping with food allergy, psychosocial concerns, um, educational issues for managing food allergy, and our clinical experience. And so our organizing structure, again, as we think about that intersection of food allergy management and child development, was to identify topics that would stay consistent across development and then filling those in with age specific strategies and information. Um, and we were fortunate to have a group of 57 caregivers of kids from from infants through young adults, as well as several young adults themselves review our handbooks to provide feedback on how readable they were, were they understandable and give feedback on specific things that might be useful to include or anything that was confusing. And our handouts were revised based on participant feedback. We were fortunate to have the Quad AI assist us with amazing graphic design to improve readability. And just wanted to share with you all that these handouts are now available as a resource on the Quad AI website in their section on tools um, for the public. These just um, went up recently within the past few weeks, and um, we hope that you will find them useful and share them. I wanted to acknowledge um, um, the Quad AI for their support in, de in um, developing our age-based educational handouts, as well as our amazing food allergy stages project team, including allergists Lisa Bartnikas, Teresa Bingaman, Wanda Fitbotanical, Michael Pistoner, um, Scott Sitcher, and Michael Young, and psychologists Linda Herbert, Ashley Ramos, and Nancy Rotter. And it, most importantly, wanted to thank all the caregivers and patients who reviewed our food allergy stages handouts and shared their feedback to improve this resource. And, and finally, um, here is my contact information if there are any questions about this presentation. Thank you again for letting me be with you today. Great.
Thank you, Dr. Lubovitch. And we have Dr. Lubovitch online for a few questions. Um, and so the first question, Dr. Lubovitch, is um, around toddler age. And at what point, how, give us some really pragmatic ways to help toddlers, number one, recognize unsafe foods, and number two, not go into full toddler meltdown when you tell them they can't have unsafe foods. <laughs> Hi, well, thanks again for allowing me to be with you today. And those are great questions. So um, I think st some strategies for helping um, toddlers become more aware of what are safe and unsafe foods. I mean, at this age, some of what you're doing is focusing on some of the basic rules in terms of checking with an adult or only eating what a parent or other trusted caregiver is giving you because it is pretty hard to expect a toddler to be able to understand those nuances of food allergy management, of course, that can be challenging even for older children and, and adults. So I think, again, going back to that focus on routines, what is the routine that you check with a parent before you eat the food or you eat the food um, or um, you're not sharing food, for example, somewhere else. And then we can um, start to talk to them a little bit about how we check to know that it's safe for them. So again, building that confidence. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we can always avoid those full toddler meltdowns, but one of the things we can think about that can help is some previewing. So if you know there are situations that are going to be tricky, so for example, a family event where there's going to be a lot of food served that they may not be able to have, or you know, a birthday party, those are some great times to talk beforehand about what the child can expect and kind of preview it. Oh, when the cake comes out, that's when we're going to bring your special cupcake out. And so this may not um, remove all the toddler meltdowns, but it may help them know what to expect um, in, to some extent. Great, thank you. So next question is on the opposite end of the spectrum of the ages and stages uh, and, and teen behavior, where teens tend to believe that they're invincible and that it could never happen to them. Any strategies for parents dealing with those invincible teens? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really great question. And again, we want, um, we want, to be, again, focused on routines versus risks. We don't want children and teens to be fearful, but of course we want them to understand that, you know, the, the, the significance and seriousness of an allergic reaction. So I like to think a lot with families of teens of thinking about what are the outcomes that we want to see and how are we gonna achieve that in a way that works for you? So for example, teens might be very concerned about standing out or they might feel like it's a pain in the neck to bring their, their auto injector or how, I'm going to, how am I going to carry it? Or I just don't wanna speak up at the restaurant. And so we, we tend to think a lot about like kind of negotiating that the exactly how you do this might be different in different situations. Um, but here are the non-negotiables that we always need to know. We always need to know we can identify safe foods. There's different ways to do that. Um, and are we bringing food? Are we, are we ordering out? Are you eating beforehand, for example? Um, and, and thinking and thinking through all aspects of this, how are we going to make it happen in a way that works for you? Um, so I think it tends to be pretty individualized. And at this age, um, teens are out there in their own, but parents are really helping with some of that advanced planning, that organizational skills to help teens plan for these situations um, ahead of time. Great, and then one final question is, sorry, I'm getting it coming through now. For school-age children, is there standardized guidance to use to work with children, or do you need to meet each child at their own developmental stage? Uh, so for school-age children, um, and is the, is the qu question about working with children, um, standardized guidance, just so I understand more it may um, be more like from a school nurse perspective if you're if there are standardized yeah, approaches yeah. that you might you know encourage them to use at different stages 
Thank you. So I think that's a really great question. And I think so some of this is going to depend on um, as I'm starting to work with kids as they're getting older, I will say one of the things that comes up a lot is wanting to kids to feel um, confident in their school setting. And so this means a couple of things. This means if there are rules that are set in the school, you want to make sure that they're being followed because kids with food allergies will be vigilant and want to make sure that the, the things that they know people are supposed to be doing to stay safe um, are actually happening. Um, but then often things come up around things like um, allergen-free tables or how do we um, handle food in a classroom or things like that. And this is a piece where I think think working with the child and the family to develop a plan where they feel confident is most important. So sometimes we can see kids actually feel quite anxious about being near food that they're allergic to, for example. And this is where these transitions happen over the school age years that we want kids to start to understand ways that they can be safe. So there are things the school can do, for example, if there are rules about cleaning tables, um, rules about having information available about food and lunches, for example, but there's also, this is also a great time for kids to start to understand what can I do and understanding things like just being near the food they're allergic to isn't dangerous. The most important thing is not to eat it. And so this is a great time for parents to work with kids, to empower them, to understand all the great things they do so that we do, you know, want those routines to be in place to help keep them safe. But I often find as kids have both the routines in the school that help keep them safe and their knowledge of the smart things they do. I'm only eating my food. I'm not sharing. I can be near it. I'm not I'm not eating it. That those that's often when kids feel most conf confident at those times. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And I do want to remind everyone that Allergy and Asthma Network is hosting a webinar dedicated to the ages and stages handouts on October 18th. And so we'll include the registration info in the follow up email for anyone who wants to attend that and certainly would encourage you to download those handouts. I think it's a great resource. And thank you so much, Dr. Lubovitch, for your work and for the committee's work on that great resource. And thanks again for participating today. Now, now we're going to move into our next presentation, and I'm going to invite Dr. Shaw to introduce Kyle Dime. So thank you. Um, this is going to be a very practical and very exciting uh, presentation. So Kyle Dine is going to present on travel and dining out. About Kyle, uh, after experiencing a harrowing, life-threatening allergic reaction in 2005, Kyle has become a globally known advocate, educator, and entrepreneur in the food allergy community. Kyle has been a consultant ambassador for Food Allergy Canada since 2008, managing advocacy campaigns and creating award-winning educational programs. He recently awarded the Michelle Harkness Member Mentorship Award for launching and leading the Allergy Pulse online mentorship program, which has helped over 1,000 children to date. His love for travel and realization for the changes for those with uh, dietary restrictions led him to start Equal Eats. The company creates products to aid in communication of special food allergy, celiac disease, and special diet in 50 languages. His goal is to make dining safer for everyone and enjoy food everywhere. So uh, let's have Kyle's recorded presentation, please. Hi there, I'm Kyle Dine, and it is a real pleasure to be with you today at the Global Food Allergy Summit. I will be presenting on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is traveling with food allergies. And I'll tell you why I have such a strong connection with it. Uh, for me, myself, I have had multiple food allergies for most of my life since I was a toddler, and I'm allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, egg, fish, shellfish, and mustard. So I've gone on a long patient journey myself, as, long as, as well as many uh, international journeys, which I'm really excited to share with you today. So to start off, a little bit about me. So when I was growing up, this, this is a picture I think of me, probably when I was age 12, 
and I have my uh, my fanny pack there with my epinephrine inside. I've got my medical alert bracelet on, and uh, I I was really could be categorized as a homebody when I was growing up. I loved to stay home. I played baseball in the summer, and a lot of that was because I didn't. I was pretty risk averse, especially with my food allergies. Traveling, um, going away from home was was a nuisance because I like to have my safe comfort zones, as most of us can relate to. We like that feeling of control of the things that we have control over. And as you start to travel, that feeling definitely can start diminishing. Nowadays, uh, I've gone from, from A to B, and it all started with an international trip that I went on exchange in university, where I went to Sweden, and it opened up my eyes to the world, how amazing travel is. I met my wife over there. There were so many amazing things that came out of it. And now I've started a company called Equal Eats, where we make uh, allergy translation cards for people with food allergies to help them dine safely and communicate around the world. I'm also a food allergy educator. I go into schools across North America, and I do full school-wide assemblies educating students about food allergies, empowering them and their friends on how they can help keep them safe. So it's all about food allergies in my life, but my passion really does come back to travel. And my one mantra with traveling with food allergies is it is not easy. It's not always easy, but it is doable. And I think that's a really healthy message to keep in mind that um, there are some extra steps. It's going to take some advanced planning. It, we can't just do spontaneous trips like some, some friends we know, but it's doable. And that to me gives me the perspective that it's okay to have food allergies. I can manage it. I can still travel the world and play sports. They don't limit me. And But travel is one of those bigger, bigger spheres that uh, just takes a little extra work, but it's doable. So I'm going to walk you through some steps today of how to get to that point. And, um, and it all really starts out with having a solid plan. And I have here a couple checklists that are available, but you can just make your own um, in terms of thinking through what you need to do to feel safe and feel that sense of control that we really crave, especially if we're going to go away from home. And it's beyond just the day before, you know, that last minute of packing, but even looking at uh, months before when you're making that booking, researching your airline policies, uh, do they let you pre-board for an international flight? And there's things with one month to go, with renewing your medication, making sure that's all good to go. We'll go through some of these in more detail, but overall it's good to start having a plan and that's gonna help you with uh, feeling anxious about a trip, knowing that you've covered your bases. And for me, when I'm traveling, uh, I, I don't like surprises. <laughs> I love to have a plan in place and then kind of let the smaller things be spontaneous. But in terms of where I'm going, what I'm eating, uh, where, I'll, where I'll be staying and uh, what would happen if anything ever happened, I like to have all of that covered. And some of the things that are really important to highlight within that, one, having travel insurance. This is really important uh, in case the worst does happen and you have an allergic reaction or your child overseas to make sure you're covered uh, and, and do your research with companies because um, just with pre-existing conditions, you can get tricky. So make sure just to talk to them, ask questions if it's covered for, for anaphylaxis and hospital visits. Uh, important to have backup food. That is my giant box of granola bars that I bring with me everywhere I go. I've always got them wherever I travel. I don't always use them, but I know I've got something that can keep me nourished and full of energy in those tight spots. So it's also good on airplanes where I never eat airplane food. I always have my own food. Um, next up, know your spots and emergency info. So this is really important, especially for international trips where 911, that emergency number might be different. Uh, it's 112 across Europe. It's 999 in the UK, 000, I believe, in Australia. So knowing that is very important. And also nearby hospitals, what, what to, where to go if something does happen. Important to have up-to-date medicine as well, making sure your epinephrine auto-injectors are in date and that you have extra because it could be difficult to get another replacement one while traveling and that's important domestically or internationally just making sure you always have those accessible now airlines is usually one of these big questions i get of what what are the extra steps you need to take 
to fly. And I know that's a very harrowing thought to be 30,000 feet up uh, and have a, a life-threatening food allergy. But overall, I've been on a lot of flights and I can say from experience, uh, I've never had any issues because I protect myself first and I'm always avoiding airline food, that last point, and I bring my own food. And for me, I, I have that control then and I'm not leaving it to chance. Checking airline policies, there's a lot, a lot out there where some will give you the opportunity to pre-board, especially in the US, um, but internationally as well. And also that you can have possibly a buffer zone where maybe it's three rows ahead, three rows behind, where flight attendants will ask uh, passengers to not consume any of your allergen. They may, might make an announcement for you as well to the whole plane to avoid that allergen. This is up to your preference, your risk uh, assessment, your, your comfort level, and you can ask airlines accordingly. Get necessary medical forms. Uh, some, some require a uh, form from your allergist or doctor that uh, shows that you require epinephrine. Uh, make sure epinephrine is in carry-on and not in your big suitcase uh, in case anything happens on a plane. And also because the temperatures underneath the plane are very cold, so you do not want to keep it out of that, uh, that sensitive range of temperature. Uh, again, packing your own meal, requesting those accommodations, and also just trying to avoid those shared things on a plane, especially that tray table. Uh, it's a great idea to pre-board, and uh, if you can wipe that down, that is really important um, just to get any germs off and avoiding the pillow blanket if they're not packaged up. When looking at accommodations, there are some great options out there. You know, we think about traditional hotels and uh, more and more are getting, um, you can get suites, you can have your own kitchenette within it. Um, when you start to have shots like this of this breakfast buffet, I know that looks a little bit daunting, but if you contact the hotel in advance and let them know about your dietary restriction, chances are they can make some type of accommodation. And I've been pleasantly surprised going to hotels where they have a separate plate ready for me and my wife who has celiac disease, and we have a special breakfast that's outside of this buffet. So it is important just to speak up on booking. You have home rentals, uh, and this can be the Airbnbs or, uh, or home away. And I love this because you have a kitchen. Uh, you can create a lot of your own food. Go to a grocery store, a local store, and get those fresh products that you can make yourself. And I enjoy that, but I also am very conscious of the risk, and that is maybe they do have allergens in their house that I can't eat. So I still want a very clean cooking area. Uh, I've even brought my own sponges before because I don't want to use a, an old sponge or I don't know what that sponge was cleaning. So I'm just mindful of those little steps and ultimately back to that feeling of control and being at ease because I've lowered my own risk. Resorts, cruises, uh, these are great as well, but it's really important you tell them in advance. A lot have policies and protocols to help you out right the moment you check in uh, to make you feel very welcome. And, and that's their job, to be hospitable and accommodating to you. My one tip here is um, tours are awesome because they will have someone really helping you out uh, as you go off resort, off cruise that will do a lot of the speaking for you, asking questions, especially in a foreign language, and they want to please, they're aiming to please, and they're aiming to get some tips as well. So um, they just want to make sure that you have a good time. When it comes to food, uh, I mentioned this before just with Airbnb, it's great to have fresh food. I love the fresh perimeter of a grocery store, uh, with the meats, the fruits, the vegetables, the dairy, uh, because once you get into labeled and prepackaged food, it can get a little bit difficult, um, especially when we go overseas. This box of granola here, this is just a sample of a European uh, cereal box, which has probably 12, 15 languages on it, so it's very hard to find a the language you're looking for not all have english in europe and b the the allergens that you're avoiding so it can be very difficult they have different labeling laws so this is kind of advanced but if you want to start looking into uh prepackaged food there are labeling legislations in europe and elsewhere and i'll share some resources to actually find that info at the end of this presentation but it's good to know because a top nine allergens in the u.s is different uh, with Europe, there's a top 14, top 10 in Canada. It changes everywhere you go. 
with restaurants, this is the one where I do not like surprises personally. I love to have a game plan going into a trip of where I'm going to dine out because then I don't have to think about it. I'm not wasting time on my trip. I just kind of follow my itinerary. So I do that research ahead of time. And there's some great apps out there, as you can see. And, uh, and it's just great to, to do some research on what is the local cuisine there? Does it contain your allergens? Or are there things that should be safe? Talk online, there's a lot of great support out there. And also, I love TripAdvisor. You can search up a restaurant that you're thinking about and put in the, the, um, in the review search area the word allergy, and you're gonna find everything that someone's mentioned about allergy. So you get a lot of firsthand info. Uh, this this is one of those basic foundational tips, but I think it just needs to be reiterated, and that is communication is key. And don't assume that people will know um, about your allergies, and um, you have to disclose. And when you do disclose, it's important to be kind. Um, a lot of food service staff are new after this pandemic, or still during, uh, so work with them. Uh, be transparent. Don't leave anything out. Be, tell them the, your whole list and what, what might be safe for you, what you've had success with in the past. But be critical. They, you, you might get some red flags and always trust your gut. We know the allergy community, we have a strong gut sense of what's safe and not and listen to that. Um, so equally, we make these type of communication cards, which are really helpful to put in writing to make sure that nothing is lost. Uh, a, when it goes through that chain in the kitchen, all those different links of people, but B, when it's in a different language as well, so it's really understood. Also good to remember that awareness might be lower where you go. Uh, there, there might be, uh, it might be their first time experiencing a guest with a food allergy or, or that type of an allergy. So be, be alert, be on guard. I've had places that thought they knew food allergy, but they kind of got it mixed up with all the other dietary restrictions that are out there. So again, you know, to putting yourselves in those situations versus doing your research and finding spots ahead of time can make all the difference where you don't have to, to go through some of that. But it's good to remember. A couple notable trips and lessons as I start wrapping it up here. Uh, for me, here's some of my favorite trips. I went to China, which was a wonderful experience uh, about 10 years ago. And I learned to never make assumptions. Uh, I never do with food, but that day I really learned to never make assumptions also with, with beverages. I ordered a milk tea when I was there, fully assuming that it was milk and tea. And uh, I actually got a spoon stirred around. I found that there was chopped almonds in the bottom of that, and it was a really close call. And now I'm just conscious of, very conscious of not only what I eat but what I drink. In Saint Lucia, um, uh, there was an incident where we realized the importance of having U.S. money, cash on us. We could have gone right away to a hospital, and this wasn't for an allergic reaction; it was for my daughter's illness. Uh, and, but we realized we could get a doctor immediately just by having U.S. money on us. So that's really good to have as well in your passport case. In Serbia, I had one party night and I actually lost my epinephrine uh, during that night. And we found it the next day during a, quite, quite the adventure trying to find where we were. But at the same time, it made me realize how important it was to have extra. And I did because incidents can happen. I have a QR code here where you can actually scan this and get a, a link to get more resources, direct resources, especially there's a chart where you can get the top allergens around the world, what labeling legislations there are. And just different guidelines, uh, some, some links to cards and whatnot, just more resources. Um, and last, I just want to leave you with saying thank you for having me. I hope that this inspired you to, um, to travel. I know what it's like being, uh, being at home. And uh, that's wonderful to have your own comfort zone. But the world is beautiful. There's so much to see. It is your oyster. And when you prepare and you adjust your expectations, it's more than just food. It's not just about cuisine. It's about the beauty. It's the people. It's geography. Um, you are going to be amazed at what's out there. And I'm so glad that you've accomplished and got over that, that hurdle. So enjoy it. There's my contact info. Please feel free to reach out if I can ask, answer anything else. Thanks, everybody. 
Thank you, Kyle. That was fantastic. And I know that I've been bit by the tra travel bug just as you have um, and loved that presentation. So uh, a few questions that have come, to, come in. First, um, as I've traveled, I've noticed improvement in restaurant identification and preparation for patients with food allergies. What has been your experience with different countries that you visited around the world? Do you think that this is improving and just their um, visible recognition and communication around food allergies? Hi hey there, it's Kyle here. Thanks everybody for attending. And uh, it's a great question. Happy to answer any more that you have. But overall, I've had food allergies since the, the mid 80s. So luckily I've seen a lot of improvements in that time. And especially with traveling. When uh, Europe enacted a, a law back in 2014, it mandated that all restaurants across the European Union, which is 27 countries, must disclose which allergens of the top 14 in Europe are in the food. So this has really helped and been a game changer for traveling to some very, very popular countries uh, where they either have to put it in writing, where you have menus with little labels with allergens, or they have to disclose verbally, where if you tell them that you have allergies, they will have to tell you about the ingredients and which allergens are in. So this is a really positive step. This is really a European um, focused law, so I haven't really seen it outside of it. But overall, in my time of traveling with food allergies, I have noticed that it's getting better. And I think as the hospitality industry as a whole is trying to really get back on its feet, uh, hopefully more and more realizing the power of our community and how loyal we are um, in our purchasing power and are doing more to accommodate us. So it's getting better. Great, thank you, Kyle. And then the next uh, question is one about just your favorites or the easiest place and perhaps your favorite place in um, traveling and then perhaps your least favorite place when traveling where you've encountered the most challenges or issues. Yeah, and, and I guess that kind of goes back to your mindset of how much you like challenges on your on your holiday. Um, so if I, if I wanted an easy breezy, I don't want to deal too much with um, too many hard discussions and challenges. I'm looking for English only or English speaking countries. This, this would probably be the first step uh, that I'd be looking for. And you have places that are really catered to tourists. And this is the difference between kind of off the beaten path um, and places that are really trying to cater to you. And those places are great because they're trying to, to help you and accommodate you in so many different ways. So the Caribbean islands, I know this, this is close, but it can be far away. A lot of these islands rely on tourism. This is their, their industry uh, in other countries like um, within that zone. Um, other than that, if you wanted to venture out into places that are more challenging, I would say it's absolutely doable. It's possible. Um, with a lot of research, a lot of the tips I covered today. Um, I, I found Italy at points really easy, but as we got in off the, the beaten path, after we went to Rome, which was pretty straightforward, we went into Tuscany, which is, uh, there's not too many big cities other than Florence in there. And we did have a lot of challenges just communicating. Uh, where We found celiac disease was really understood, but food allergies, not so much. So again, kind of goes back to those places that are tried and true, ask for recommendations on, on places other allergic families and people you know have gone to and had success with. All right, great. great. And I think we may have one more. Kyle, have you been to Turkey? Um, there's someone on the line who really wants to go, but they are worried about food allergies. I have personally not gone to Turkey. And I would love to. I've only seen pictures and I've heard that it's beautiful. It is, a, it is quite a unique language in its own right. And from what I understand, English is not so widely spoken or understood. So this would be a place where you really do need a solid plan in place of how you're going to communicate. Um, and I, I believe it's not part of the European Union, but correct me if I'm mistaken on that but it is a very, very unique place in its own right with a lot of different uh, ethnic cuisines that are coming from different parts of the world, European, Asian, it's a, a real fusion of, of mixes. So 
for that alone, I would want to be doing a lot of research on what is a common main dish. What do people eat in Turkey? Um, because right when you step over that border, that that is one of those countries where things change a lot. So again, I think any country is doable. I just think that the more research and planning and prep with cuisine and knowing emergency numbers and uh, being equipped with uh, being able to handle the language and communicate your allergies, you're going to make it uh, make it possible. But uh, Turkey would be a country that would have a couple more steps involved for sure, but doable. All right. One further question that came in regarding uh, pre-boarding on airlines. What are the benefits? Is it simply to wipe down before you take your seat or other benefits that you've noticed? Great question. So, yeah, this this was a decision that was made a few years ago by the Department of uh, the, the DOT, Department of Transportation, where it's uh, you can request this of American airlines when you're when you're departing in America to pre-board and this can really be an advantage if you want a couple extra minutes to be on the plane without that pressure of putting your overhead bag up and all of the the craziness when you first get on a plane to take a minute and actually wipe down the tray table uh, wipe down your seat the armrest and this can just give you a little extra time especially if you have small kids and things are all, already a little bit busy for you I read one study where they found the trade table is one of the most contaminated spots on an airplane. So it's good just to, to make sure that you're eating off a clean surface because we know that peanuts, nuts, this can be a very common snack on airlines. And it might not be thoroughly cleaned, especially if it's not the first flight of the day. If you're flying in the afternoon, uh, it, it's an idea to, um, to pre-board or at least if you're not pre-boarding, clean your tray table with a, a wet, wet wipe and uh, make sure that you're Staying, staying safe. Great. Thank you so much, Kyle. It was great to hear from you. Thanks for joining. I know you had a lot of conflicts today and made the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. We are going to continue to share this out globally. I think um, so much helpful information, valuable resources that you offered, and uh, we really appreciate your expertise and experience today. And so now we're going to move into our next presentation. I invite Dr. Shaw to introduce Dr. Gupta. So thank you, Tanya. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to invite Dr. Gupta to the podium. Um, Dr. Gupta has 17 years of experience as a board certified pediatrician and health researcher and serve as the founding director of the Center of Food Allergy and Asthma Research at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, and Anne and Robert H. Louis Children's Hospital of Chicago. Dr. Gupta is world renowned for her groundbreaking research in food allergy and asthma epidemiology, most notably for her research on prevention uh, of uh, food allergy, uh, prevalence of pediatric and food allergy in the United States. Dr. Gupta is the author of Food Allergy Experience and Food Allergy Without Fear, and I have the copy to prove it. Uh, uh, she has been on multiple national media. Uh, she really supports uh, and advocates for food allergy families. It's my absolute pleasure to invite Dr. Gupta, please. Thanks so much, Dr. Shah, and thank you, Tanya, for having me. It is an absolute pleasure to be here and, uh, and talk to you all today about demystifying food labels. Here are my disclosures. Okay, so um, let's start out with really quickly revisiting uh, prevalence. So food allergy is very common. It impacts about 8% of kids in the US. That's about two in every classroom. Uh, and when you look at the types of foods that, and this is children, so this is our most recent pediatric study looking at the types of food kids are impacted by. And here you can see it's the top nine, we call it, peanut, milk, shellfish, tree nuts, egg, thin fish, wheat, soy, and sesame. Now, different foods uh, occur at different age groups, and we talk a lot about you know, how they outgrow it, and I believe you talked a lot about this yesterday, so this is just a quickie. Um, as you can see, in young, young kids, milk and egg are most prevalent. Um, peanut and tree nut are starting to develop, but we don't know if this is because they're not trying it yet, and shellfish and finfish as well. But you do see milk and egg uh, being outgrown 
more frequently as opposed to peanut tree nuts, shellfish, finfish, which uh, last a lot longer and into adulthood. Okay, so, but any food can last through adulthood and make that clear and any food you can grow out of, it's just different percentages. Here you see severity, any food can cause a severe allergic reaction and this is very, very important to know. Quickly, ED visits, you know, one in five parents reported that their child went to the emergency room in the past year for an allergic reaction and about 42% in their lifetime. We also took a look at reactions that parents were reporting through a registry and we found that almost half of caregivers were reporting their child having a reaction in the past year. So, and you can see about 30% said more than one reaction. So, you know, the other number I gave you was going to the emergency room, but these are any reactions because as all of us know, every reaction you know, you are not heading to the emergency room, but it's so important for us to understand how often these reactions are occurring. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly tell you adults, adult food allergies, these are the top nine again, just in a different order, because labeling is important for children and adults. So shellfish, milk, peanut, tree nut, fin fish, wheat, egg, soy, and sesame. What's really interesting, I'm telling you this really quick, but uh, in adults, about when we asked adults about food allergies, about one in five told us they had a food allergy. One in five, that's 20%. When we cleaned that data and we looked at how many had a convincing food allergy, it was about one in 10. But only about one in 20 are going to a physician to get diagnosed. So this is you know, a key message I really want to put out there is get the diagnosis because there are so many food conditions. That's actually why we wrote the book is Adults, you know, we never take care of ourselves as well as we take care of our kids. And it's really important for us to, because we need to know if it's a true food allergy, if it's a, you know, a intolerance or any other type of food condition. Okay, again, severity, any food can be severe. Adults about one in 10, we're going to the emergency room with a food allergic reaction. This, I really want to point out, and this is very important for labeling as well, about half of adults told us they developed a new allergy as an adult. Okay, so that is a lot of adults developing new onset food allergies. So just know that that can happen and it is an important consideration. Okay, now we're going to get into labeling. So all of that, just to talk about how labeling is done. So. Um, labeling is complicated in the United States, and currently uh, the, the rule or the regulation, FALSPA, says that if any of those top allergens, and right now it's only the eight, so peanut, milk, shellfish, tree nuts, egg, finfish, wheat, soy, uh, and then sesame is going to start, thanks to the Fast Act, which we'll get to, which we're really excited about, in January of 2023. But currently, until then, which is only a few months old, Okay. Um, all of the other top eight, if they are in the product, they need to be on the package clearly labeled. And we'll get into showing how. But the biggest issue with packaged goods right now is precautionary allergen labeling. And what this says are words like may contain or manufactured in a facility, right? All of these labels that go behind packages um, are voluntary. And most of the public don't know that. So they are not regulated uh, and so industry chooses what they want to put on their packaging and this makes life very difficult and confusing for all of you and all of us uh, the consumers now this we we did a study looking at what people know you know what is the knowledge around this and i just want to point this out these four questions uh, so current U.S. law requires that food labels identify the names of all major allergens. That's the one that we had talked about, which is true. And so 68% of people got that right, 69, almost 70. That was pretty good. But then precautionary allergen labeling, those may contains uh, product produced on equipment with shared tree nut products, is that mandated by law? And you can see the answer is false, as we just discussed, but only about half of people knew that. And you know, 28% said, I really actually don't know. Um, and then precautionary allergen labeling, this is the other big misconception is based on the amount of allergen in that food, right? So some people, and I'm gonna show you this data, 
may think that may contain is more dangerous than manufactured in a facility. So those are the issues that come up because only 43% of people got that right. So a majority of people don't know or think that, okay, there is a threshold there. There's an amount of food and it goes down depending on what that label says. All right, so how do you find out if you can eat precautionary allergen labeled food? right? Because it's on almost everything you buy. So how are you managing this in your daily life? So we asked, we said, have you talked to your doctor about this? You know, can you eat this, you know, a PAL food? Have you discussed this? And you see individuals with food allergies, those are adults with food allergy versus children, almost half uh, of caregivers of children said that they had discussed this with their doctor. And half of them said their doctor said, avoid the food. Um, and then you see, we did not discuss this, about 40% of adults. So they're not actually having the conversation with their physician to understand what they should do with packaged labels. Um, and about 27% of caregivers said they're not having that conversation. So need to make sure you have this conversation with your allergist. Okay. Um, in the study, we also asked, has you or your child ever reacted because of a precautionary allergen label. And actually 27% said yes. They think they've had a reaction to a food that had a precautionary allergen label on it. That's a lot. About one in four people are having reactions to PAL. Oh, whoops, did I go the wrong way? Okay, here we go. Shopping habits. Now this is such a key slide I really wanna point out because this is what people are doing. And you know, having a child with food allergy I, I tend to agree, you know, you're making your own decisions of risk every day. You know, there's no food available. There's a package good. It says, you know, manufactured in a facility. Do I give this to my kid or search for something else when they're starving, right? Like, so how do you make these decisions? And as you can see here, we asked people about a bunch of different ones may contain, which we're all very familiar with manufactured in a facility that also processes, manufactured on a line, good manufacturing practices were used to segregate, may contain traces of allergen. So people who said, I never purchased this, you see the top one may contain allergen. 80% said, I never purchased this. But then you look at manufactured in a facility, only half said, I never purchased this. What does that mean? That means that people feel it's safer to have something that says manufactured in a facility or manufactured in, on a line or good manufacturing practices were used, um, they're making their own risk assessment. We're saying that sounds safer than may contain, right? We're saying maybe that means there's not as much allergen on it, even though there are no regulations around what people put on packaging. And then the reason why, when we said, well, why do you purchase these things? Well, I purchased, I purchased it in the past and it seemed to be okay. You know, I, it made me feel confident. The option is safe for my family. So, you know, we're just making this up on our own and that's not right. We asked consumers what they would want on packages. What would you prefer to have on packages? And they were so clear. They said, just tell me if I should buy it or if I shouldn't. Do I eat it or do I not? I don't want to be making these decisions. So they really wanted not suitable for people with X allergy. They just wanted to know, I don't eat it or I do eat it. May contain was there, if you had to give me a choice, they wanted may contain and on all packaging. And so not all this variability. Um, but the main thing they kept telling us is just tell me yes or no. You know, tell me it's free from or I shouldn't eat it. That makes total sense. They also want it clearly marked on the front, on the back, icons. You know, what can we do to make it more clear on packaging? Right now it's bolding and then you have, you know, this precautionary allergen statement usually. We asked them where they wanted it. You know, all these great, great things that we have now have information to be able to together advocate for families and get packaging, you know, safer. Okay, let's talk about how it is right now. And I'm just showing you some examples and these are tips. So um, these are a couple ways that uh, labels can appear. So they can use the common name, using specific ingredient name, or using a separate contains note. 
with all the allergens. So there's some examples in the slide here where you can see using the common name in the ingredient list, uh, using a contains list on the bottom, which is always much more helpful. Um, and then, so read it every time, no matter if you've eaten this before, you know, a lot of mistakes are made because uh, products do change their ingredients, you know, so make sure you always read this label. And then you can see the precautionary allergen label. It is typically on the bottom, it says may contain peanut, wheat, and sunflower ingredients, but these labels, again, have all kinds of statements and you need to look out for those. Um, so, we have more resources, which I'll give you our website at the end on how to read labels that I would love you know, to share with all of you. I just want to mention the FASTER Act again. This was really thanks to all of you, thanks to all the advocacy organizations coming together and really pushing for sesame to be on the label. And, and this is so important because sesame is such a hidden ingredient and so many people have reported even, you know, come to us and I'm sure come to, you know, advocacy organizations like this saying, okay, I reacted, right? And so it's awesome to see everyone come together in our community and make sure that this fast track got passed. So now Sesame will be on labels as of January, 2023. The fast track also included a couple other things that are very supportive of food allergy families. Okay, before I go to this, I wanna show you a couple of resources we have on our website. Um, it's cfar.northwestern.edu. We, we have developed a passport and a workbook for families. We did this um, in conjunction with many families in the Chicagoland area, and it's very, um, very approachable, um, low literacy, easy to read, lots of pictures, great for kids, and it's free just download it. Um, we're also developing an app to make it easier for, for families to have. And then this is the book um, that uh, Dr. Shah mentioned um, for anyone who is interested. And then finally, I just wanted to give you access to us. This is our website and our, our social media handles. And uh, yeah, please connect with us. You know, I, I learned so much from everyone in this room. I do wanna mention that we are working very hard right now on uh, advocating for better labels. So hearing your thoughts, we want some level of thresholds. Ideally, it would be great like the gluten-free um, to have you know, food allergy-free or certain allergen-frees. And we're trying to figure out those thresholds right now. A lot of investigators and advocacy groups across the country. So thank you very much. coming in for Dr. Gupta. First, um, are small companies in Shield different labeling standards than larger companies? Do you know if oh. they have different requirements? So as far as I know, the FALSPA requires all companies to label top allergens. So there isn't a requirement of like companies smaller than... Not that I know. Do yeah. you, Tanya? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, anyone else? I wasn't else? sure, yeah. but I, I don't I'm I pretty don't sure so. that's gonna, law. I'm going to research it during the yeah. break. Thank you. Those are good questions. Um, and any tips for when a company doesn't respond or when customer service doesn't know what their ingredients are, or you know, you you call to get more information on these ambiguity, amb yeah. ambiguous labels. And how do you handle that? Like, what what's the best tip for even calling, inquiring, and and dealing with that? Uh, it's so complex. I mean, I feel like companies are getting better. Um, just like you know, Kyle and mentioned in the last one, I feel like the world is is understanding food allergies more. So if it is a company that you call and they can't give you information on it, avoid it, right? Like don't take chances or risks. And if there's a way to report it or go higher and make sure they know that they should be, you know, having that information at hand, you know, do it. It's it's still a, a crazy world. I mean, we we were you know, Kyle was mentioning Italy. We were there and there was one restaurant that, and I took a picture of it, actually had a sign and said, if you have a food allergy or you know any food condition, do not eat here. I mean, it straight up said, we do not want you here. And, and then there were others that were just so amazing. So I think as a community, we need to make sure, you know, we keep building awareness and building with kindness, you know, support for food allergies. And I can tell you, I've had a couple of very, very large uh, food industry companies come on board and say, we want to label better 
for your families. You know, we want to make sure we do the best we can. We're behind you in advocating for better, uh, better laws to, to know your thresholds. Which really leads me to the last question. If you were to have your crystal ball out, yeah. and, and goodness knows we had no idea what 10 years would hold 10 years ago in this respect, but look forward 10 years, what do you think the difference will be in the way that manufactured prepackaged foods are labeled in regard to allergies? Yes. Um, and, and any um, opportunities maybe that we as a community to help advocate for, for things like the icons and you know, front of package labeling, those sorts of things. Great, yes. So I, you know, one of the most frustrating things as a researcher is when you publish something and then 10 years go by and nothing's happened. And that's what happened with PAL. We published our first papers on this over 10 years ago globally. And then 10 years later, we published another one and nothing's changed. And so we're not gonna let another 10 years go by. Uh, that is not acceptable. So what I would love to see, and this is where I need your help, like what would you love to see, and that's why we asked, is uh, like it has gluten-free, you know, peanut-free, you know, and that we have a threshold that we can prove. And there are research who have shown this. Um, what is a level of allergen that you will not react to, you know? And if we know that and we can give it to companies so they can clearly mark all packaging, just like everyone wants, yes, you're safe to eat it or no, you're not, you know, and not have any ambiguity in that. And I know, Tanya, with your help uh, and, you know, just everyone watching and, you know, just our amazing community, we can make this happen. Yeah, I think, you know, again, the Fast Direct is one of those examples that when the community yes. really gets focused and aligned and has a clear message, a clear ask, how we can move something forward pretty quickly. Um, so two more questions. What about regulations for listing spices? Is there <sighs> anything required there? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, not that I know of. There is there is nothing yet. It took us forever to get sesame. And you know, I know this is a global audience listening, and we are really behind the times. So when you go to Europe and so many places, the icons are so clear, everything is marked. There's so many additional foods and spices listed. You know, we as a community need to decide on the next couple of foods that we want clearly listed. And we've been trying to do it with our prevalence work. What are the most common next set of foods that we can have policies passed about listing clearly on packaging? But yeah, that's very challenging. And then final question, is a company allowed to have the symbol or number of allergens instead of the main name like soy E102 or E10? And is there a threshold of five parts per million for food allergens? There is, that's the threshold we yeah, wanna we get. Like to yeah, see. just like gluten right now, it's like 20 parts per million, right? And if it's below that, it's gluten free. And that is exactly what we're trying to do for food allergy. So that's a great question. You know, in the US, and it, again, it's a global audience, I should have like talked about all the amazing stuff being done all over the world, but, um, in the US, I believe it has to be either the name, you know, the actual name, Tanya's. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We can't use the symbols, symbols in the US. No. It doesn't meet the requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. How come dairy free still contains dairy? <laughs> uh, um, wow. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I think that there are different, um, again, Falfa is so lengthy yes. and complex yes. and difficult to understand as far as the oversight of this um, in, in the regulatory body of FDA that oversees this, right? Yes. But um, it's a good question. We'll, we'll research it. Yeah. Talk to you. <laughs> I love the stumpers because you give us homework. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Gutta. Again, Thank such you. a fun journey that we've been on yes. together. Absolutely. And, you know, Dr. Gutta, again, um, Really, uh, it was not said in her intro, but um, it, it was stressed in, in some of the points. 150 peer-reviewed publications in the last 10 years, right? <laughs> that about 10 years that have really just set such the foundation for our understanding of burden and prevalence and where we're going in food allergy. And um, just, again, a. a global icon in this space that we are so honored to have as part of our program today. Um, so now I'm gonna invite Dr. Doug Jones up to introduce our next presentation, Gia Rosenblum. 
thank you. I'm so excited to hear this presentation. I have a particular interest in the kind of the psychosocial aspect of food allergy, and we couldn't be more blessed than to hear from Dr. Rosenblum. So she received her doctorate in psychology from Rutgers University, go Big Ten, and is a licensed psychologist in New Jersey. She has over 20 years of experience in clinical practice and more than a decade in psychological research and teaching. She's currently in private practice, and Dr. Rosenblum provides individuals, families, uh, and group psychotherapy sessions across the lifespan with a particular focus on recovery from trauma. Additionally, she treats depression, anxiety, and has a unique experience in helping individuals and families cope with the life-threatening uh, food allergies and complex medical issues, and also the diagnosis of genetic disorders. She's a member of the, the American Psychological Association and of particular interest as a mother of a young adult with multiple food allergies, Dr. Rosenblum developed her expertise in the psychosocial aspects of food allergy after observing that other families like hers had difficulty finding a mental health professional with food allergy knowledge. Uh, she's been teaching about food allergy and anxiety since 2009. So turn it over to her. I'm so excited for this. I'm Dr. Gia Rosenblum, and I'm going to be talking with you today about understanding the stress of food allergies and thinking about behavioral and emotional coping strategies. I'm a psychologist in private practice in New Jersey. I have a daughter with multiple food allergies, and I have been talking about this topic for well over a decade. It's very, very important to me, and I'm glad you're here to um, get this information today. So in 2018, I wrote an article for the New Jersey Psychologist, and in this article, I tried to really break down the sources of stress in food allergy. Um, unfortunately, so often, um, whether we're caregivers of someone with food allergy or we have food allergies ourselves, sometimes we're met with some skepticism about whether it's really so hard to live with food allergy. Is it so difficult to eliminate something from your diet, um, to manage it? But I know for my own experience, both personally and professionally, and for talking to, you know, talking with hundreds of families with food allergy, that it is incredibly stressful and can take a real toll and create a real burden. And I thought it might be helpful to understand why, what are the components that make up this stressor? Some of this might be intuitive to you, some of it might be information you haven't thought of before, and it might even help you communicate with others, whether it's your medical professionals, your family members, your friends, so that they can understand a little bit better what we are dealing with when we're living with food allergy day in and day out. So first of all, when we're living with food allergies, the threat, which is our allergens, can be everywhere. Any food containing environment, especially if you're allergic to something like milk or wheat or soy or egg, which are ubiquitous in a modern diet, um, contain threat to your health and to your safety. And that threat can literally be anywhere. Because of that pervasiveness, we are constantly having to be cautious. It's very difficult in any food containing environment that you're not in control of yourself to let down your guard and to feel completely at ease and comfortable. And so that constant cautiousness, that need for vigilance throughout the day, throughout your life, really is another primary stressor in food allergy. In order to successfully manage food allergy, whether it's managing a food containing environment or managing an allergic reaction, a lot of control of our own behavior is required. And that too is effortful. So when we're dealing with managing our food, bringing food with us places, um, organizing outings or events that might contain food, we're needing to exert a level of control over our own behavior or if you're a caregiver over our children's behavior, that's kind of above and beyond what the people around us are needing to do. And that contributes to the stress as well. When we're dealing with food containing environments, often if we're not eating at home with food that we've prepared ourselves, we're needing to engage socially. So we have these high social skills demands that come along with food allergy. We might need to talk to waiters, chefs, caterers, family members, friends, if we're eating in their houses, um, Girl Scout leaders, Boy Scout leaders, coaches, anybody who's providing food to our family member with food allergies, we're gonna need to engage and negotiate and navigate with them around how to manage safely so that we can eat safely, we can provide safe food for our kids. 
For individuals who are super gregarious, love talking, don't mind sharing personal details about their lives, this might be easy, it might be seamless. For individuals who are more shy, more private, more socially anxious, this demand to be social and engage around something really important can be a huge burden. And in the worst case scenarios, especially with young people or adolescents, they might choose to avoid the social skill demand and risk their safety rather than deal with managing the social situation. So this is another huge stressor. Going along with that, really unfortunately, there's plenty of evidence of there being actual social cruelty around food allergy. There are things, um, there's research indicating that bullying takes place in schools and in other settings where kids interact with each other around food and generally low social support. Um, things are improving, certainly, and educating the public about food allergy, but overall, we don't get a ton of engagement from our communities around supporting us in living with food allergy. And as everybody knows, getting good support around a difficult stressor helps make it easier to manage. So the absence of that social support contributes to the level of stressfulness that we experience. Finally, for any situation where there's uncertainty or a lack of control, that increases the level of stress from any circumstance. So stressors are by definition, things we can't control, things we're uncertain about, and food allergy is filled with uncertainty and lack of control. All of those food containing environments, including manufactured foods, where we're uncertain about what our labels really mean, we might need to call multiple companies in order to understand their manufacturing practices. All of that lack of, of kind of clarity about what we're dealing with also escalates the level of stress. And, and finally, I think I said finally before, but this is my final point. Somewhat unique to food allergy is the need for each of us to behave like a first responder. Because epinephrine is the first line treatment for anaphylaxis and epinephrine must be administered rapidly when we think there's an anaphylactic reaction or we suspect there's been a, an uh, ingestion of a food allergen, we are responsible for ourselves or for our children or the people that we are caring for to number one, identify if an allergic reaction is occurring, discern whether it is progressing to anaphylaxis or not, and then administer medication through injection. Each of those in and of itself is a high demand, is a highly stressful experience. And unfortunately, research has shown that many folks in the food allergy world are not super confident about their capacity to do that responding effectively. There's doubt about whether uh, they're able to identify anaphylaxis appropriately. There's doubt about the ability to administer epinephrine effectively. Um, and so those, uh, the pair of those two things, the need to be a first responder and low confidence about doing it also adds to the stressfulness of day-to-day -day living with food allergy. So hopefully taking a look at all of these bullet points and thinking about the role that each of them plays in your life can help you understand why this stress is so real. Um, we're not making it up. We're not exaggerating. The stressors are measurable and identifiable. In addition, our psychological perception of our experience with food allergy matters and contributes to stress and anxiety. So for example, the risk, the actual objective risk of death from ingestion of a food allergen is very, very low, fortunately. Prevention is very effective, so the frequency of those injections are maintained pretty low. But even more importantly, the appropriate first response with injectable epinephrine is incredibly effective at halting an allergic reaction. So the risk of death ends up being low. However, that is not frequently the perception of people in the food allergy community. There's a sense that the risk of death is high. There's also a sense that the experience of anaphylaxis is more frequent than perhaps it actually is. And these two things come together and decrease quality of life and increase levels of anxiety. What that creates, however, is an opportunity for intervention. So really getting accurate information about risks, really understanding how to effectively provide emergency response can reduce anxiety, reduce stress, and make coping much more easy. So I had a client, for example, who was peanut allergic. He was afraid to walk down the aisle in the supermarket where peanut butter was kept. We spent some time talking to his allergist, making sure that that, in fact, was really safe, helping him understand his risks more accurately, and that greatly reduced his anxiety. So that's an important intervention. 
Often in food allergy, we have the misperception that worry, thinking constantly about the allergy, thinking constantly about things to do uh, to make it better, to reduce risk, and avoidance. So I'm not going to go down the aisle in the supermarket, for example, that has my allergen. That's going to keep me safe. Worry plus avoidance equals safety. But that is an anxious belief that's not actually grounded in reality. The actual coping comes from these components. So knowledge, accurate understanding of risk, accurate understanding of your allergens, accurate understanding of what anaphylaxis looks like, feels like, how to administer epinephrine, and preparation for all of those actions that need to be taken both to prevent allergic uh, exposures and also responding to allergic reactions, plus support. So getting that social support on board, all of that is what contributes to safety. So thinking more clearly about what actually helps, we can think in these different categories. So again, thinking about accurate information, getting good education. So what are really the risks? The risks of introducing new foods, the risks of ingesting your allergen, um, how to effectively avoid those allergens. All of that contributes to increasing safety and also decreasing anxiety. Learning about anxiety itself and the stress response is enormously helpful. Sometimes people confuse anxiety and panic symptoms with their allergic response. But working with your physicians, working with a counselor to really learn about your body, really learn about the anxiety and stress response helps you decide what's actually going on in your body. And that's gonna help you with your safety and reducing levels of anxiety. It's important to recognize that food allergy affects a whole family. So getting support from people outside the family, whether that's friends, food allergy coaches, counselors, whoever your support team might be, so that we understand that everybody in the family might need support. We wanna build skills and think about solving problems. So identifying whatever obstacles there are to managing food allergies, and then figuring out in a detailed manner so that you can rehearse and plan what those solutions are over time can be really beneficial. And I'll go into a little more detail about that in a moment. Learning relaxation and anxiety reduction skills. So practicing things like meditation, breathing relaxation, yoga, drawing, using art, being out in nature to just help each individual managing food allergy bring their level of stress and anxiety down each day enormously helpful in managing. And obviously we mentioned avoidance, what's often avoided are situations, but also foods. So we want with our kids, with ourselves, to be including a diverse number of safe foods in our diet and to be preventing any unnecessary avoidance of foods that are actually safe. Working with your allergist, working with a counselor, working with the people in your life that are supporting you to really understand risks understand what's unnecessary avoidance and what's necessary avoidance, um, to talk about beliefs in a family system, which we'll talk about in another slide, a little bit more detail, and looking for facts rather than these beliefs that may or may not be grounded in the truth. We want to identify family and social system support where we can find it. We want to work on improving uh, communication skills within a family. and. Because food allergy involves a lot of losses, it involves loss of freedom, loss of flexibility. Um, there may be changes in school settings, there may be changes in job options. Um, it's important to process the grief for those losses and also to process any grief there might be if there are unsupportive family members. And recognizing once again that we have to build non-family support as well as inside family support. So how can we go even further in preventing anxiety uh, for our kids, for the people we care for, for ourselves? We want to take the idea that anything that is new and novel and unfamiliar can be stressful and anxiety provoking. So we wanna make new environments as familiar as possible, whether that's first day in a new school, travel, um, going to college, which just happened for my daughter. We want to involve ourselves in getting familiar as quickly as we can taking tours, meeting people, reviewing websites, watching videos, 
Uh, and this can be as simple as going onto a restaurant's website, reviewing their menus, talking to your children about what the plan is to eat safely, uh, calling ahead, discussing those experiences, not just to establish safety, but to establish familiarity as well. All of that is gonna reduce that anxiety. We wanna practice again, some daily activities that help regulate the body and the mind. And as I mentioned before, things like exercise, breathing, relaxation, um, as well as activities, whatever they may be, that create a sense of confidence and competence. So that might be being great at baseball, that might be learning how to knit, that might be singing. Anything that helps us feel efficacious in the world generally helps us bring down our level of stress and anxiety, even if it's totally unrelated to food allergy. So making sure your children and yourselves build in those kinds of activities into your lives is really important. It's also important that we feel allowed and able to express our emotions, whatever they are. So whether you have a food allergy, your child has a food allergy, having environments and safe people and, and situations where you're able to express your feelings is crucially important. Withholding emotion, feeling like you're not allowed to show how you truly feel, escalates stress, just like holding your breath escalates stress. So knowing that it's okay to be sad, to be angry, to be scared, knowing who is your support, support team, who do you rely on, who do you look to, to provide you that support and going to them when you need it is also gonna help you cope and help you feel calmer. Specifically, again, thinking about planning and reviewing, we wanna seek to end avoidance. We wanna review and plan our food options so that ourselves and our children, they understand what the plan is gonna be so that that avoidance doesn't come into place. Um, even with young children, we wanna give them choices and control where that is possible, um, letting them know ahead of time, like, okay, well, I'm gonna be in charge of dinner, but you can choose from these three safe options for dessert, or I'm gonna bring the safe dessert, but you could have pasta or you could have chicken at this restaurant because those are both safe for you. Making sure that you're always giving uh, information accurate information and some choices. And finally, rehearsal and practice. So with our epinephrine auto injectors, which are often the source, as I mentioned earlier, of higher levels of stress and anxiety, practice, planning, and rehearsal is crucially important. Using your expired auto injectors, using trainers, watching videos, working with your allergist or physician to practice so that you begin to achieve that sense of comfort and control and competence around this life-saving intervention that we are responsible for in food allergy. Um, I've had clients who found it really helpful to watch videos, learning about how their auto injector actually worked, what the mechanics inside the device looked like. There was just something magical and mystical about it. And this brought it right down to earth that it was a very simple structure inside that propelled the medication. Um, that was calming and comforting. That may not be true for you or your loved one, but I would explore and investigate what would feel comfortable and what would help you feel more at ease with this particular part of the food allergy safety plan. So once you've become comfortable with using your epinephrine auto injector, it's really important not just to prepare, not just to work on prevention, but to prepare for actually coping with an allergic reaction if one occurs. So I recommend people doing allergic reaction drills. So if your family member, your loved one, whether it's your child, your sibling, your spouse has an allergic reaction, what's gonna happen next? Just like you are recommended to do fire drills in your house and where do you go? How do you get to safety? Same thing with allergic reactions. So talking through it, walking through it, thinking about what happens at home, what happens at school, what happens in the workplace, for example. Uh, use your imagination, you can write a play, you could act things out with stuffed animals, you can do role play with your children, all of which help decrease that novelty, decrease that uncertainty, increase control, increase a sense of comfort and confidence. You might even want to practice how you're going to communicate with each other. What are you going to say? Are you going to keep a calm demeanor? We all get flustered, we all have trouble finding our words, knowing that you're rehearsing to say, for example, to your child, I hear you coughing, I see you have hives, I think you're having an allergic reaction. 
I'm going to ask you to lie down on the couch while I get your epinephrine. I'm going to give you an injection. You're going to be just fine. And then we're going to call for the ambulance to come so they can check you out and make sure you're okay. All of that rehearsal comes in really handy when we're stressed and flustered. You also, I like to remind people to think about what you're going to need and re rehearse asking for what's needed. Are you going to need help watching a child if one of your children needs to go to the emergency room? Are you going to need help wrangling a pet? Are you going to need help with direction? Just thinking through rather than avoiding can help you be prepared for any circumstance. And I want to talk a little bit more about family support because family systems vary widely in their responses to food allergy. Your nuclear family, your significant other, your children together, your family of origin, your partner's family of origin, and the extended family might have different reactions to food allergy, ranging from disbelief to abundant support. What we're always striving for is, first of all, acceptance that food allergy is real and it is serious. Um, adoption of appropriate food allergy management strategies by everyone. Hopefully support expressed directly, verbally, overtly um, to food allergic persons and their caregivers. And of course, the absence of minimization or disparagement or shaming or criticism. You know, these are what we're hoping for in our family environments. And of course, we want to encourage the most adaptive coping in the allergic person. So especially if it's a child, if the whole family can come together around encouraging them, carrying their epinephrine, wearing a medical alert bracelet, for example, if they need one, um, talking with their, um, let's say, their teachers, their coaches, the other people they interact with, a whole family support can mean uh, a great deal. And if your entire family isn't able to do that, you want to find the family members that provide that, that support and really focus on your connection to them. So I really want to convey that there are some silver linings. Managing food allergy, stress, and anxiety is possible. All of the things I've mentioned here and many more, you may want to choose to work with a coach or work with a therapist who's got familiarity with food allergy to help you with this. Um, but it is possible. I like to explain to people that anxiety and vigilance can only come down to what's an ecologically valid level. What that means is like a certain amount of anxiety and stress is normal with food allergy. We're not going to get it to zero because it's a stressful thing. So that anxiety, however, at a controlled, moderate level can actually help keep us safe. It can help us become conscious and aware of our environments. It can help us sharpen our performance in terms of, let's say, making sure we ask the chef the questions we need to ask, making sure we call ahead and talk to a family member before a holiday meal. So it's not always a bad thing. We just want to keep it at a level that's not disruptive in our lives and not causing any unnecessary discomfort or avoidance or detriment to our lives. I thank you so much for your attention. I hope that this has been helpful to you. Um, and I appreciate all the work that everyone does in keeping themselves and their families safe. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblum. Uh, Dr. Rosenblum is just such a valuable resource for us at Allergy and Asthma Network, and she uh, came alongside our Director of Education, Sally Schessler, to develop a food allergy coach certification, 12 modules that actually walks clinical health, mental health professionals through what is most important to know in working alongside food allergic families. And so just so very grateful. And, and again, that certification is available and online for anyone who's interested, but really was designed for those uh, mental health providers. So um, Dr. Rosamund was not able to join us for Q&A, but we do have a few questions that have come in that we're gonna pose to Dr. Jones and Dr. Shaw, and also some questions that have sort of been lingering for the, for the first half of our program. So I'm going to invite them to the podium, and then I'm going to go with the, the roaming mic and uh, pr present the questions, have you guys respond accordingly. questions coming in for those of you who are online. We really appreciate um, all of the questions and, and perspectives that are being offered. So first up, um, sort of a follow on to Dr. Rosenblum's presentation. Have you seen in your practice um, food allergic individuals who experience eating disorders, body image issues, or even maybe develop like a tick uh, just because of the anxiety associated with food allergy? 
Yes, to all of those. Uh, we've seen uh, patients have those eating disorders, and we actually have patients now because uh, in our group there's a neuropsychology gr uh, group just close by and they're seeing patients with eating disorders that they're referring over to our clinic you know because the weight and the stress of that anxiety gets so heavy that uh, absolutely they can develop that aversion to, to the foods even the thought of it um, for, and it's hard I think if you haven't actually had that experience you, you know that life-threatening experience sometimes to really put yourself in those shoes and the easiest thing that I can think of is I've had food poisoning twice and that was a miserable experience and I don't even like thinking about you know that experience with that food and I think that's a drop in the bucket compared to perhaps what these kids have had and and that may have developed it at such a young age and my heart just goes out to them uh, but they carry that so yeah we've seen it all across the board any helpful tips on especially like um one one person online commented around ticks that their child um sort of presented after anaphylaxis any helps or, or tips that you offer for help to help reduce those sites uh types of responses for, for me it's um i'm not a professional in dealing with ticks so uh i'm i'm trained in dealing with you know the food allergy side but that's where i think it's important to find those people like you know if you have your certified coaching classes or those professionals that are really trained that have that expertise i think they can offer that different level to, to help people so i actually have tried to find people in our local area uh counselors and psychologists that we can work with directly that have that experience because i, I think it's important that they get to the right people with the right tools yeah, and I often say, um, you know, in, in working with especially uh, parents, anxious parents oftentimes sort of create anxious children, right? And so dealing with our own anxiety, making sure that we're managing that appropriately and that we're talking and processing that through with our child um, is really important. I thought that Gia gave some great tips on anxiety pretend, prevention. Um, so the next question comes from Dr. James online, who says, how do you work with families to prepare them and to reduce the anxiety around epinephrine use specifically? So Dr. Shaw, maybe you address that one. It, it's a concern we deal with every day. And uh, the only way around is education. So those who have stress and anxiety about using epinephrine or carrying epinephrine, I think the message has to be ongoing that it's better to be safe rather than in a situation where it could be serious or life-threatening. And EpiPen is, or epinephrine auto-injector is the first line of defense when you have an allergic reaction. So previous presentation, there are some nuggets where talking about epinephrine, use of epinephrine, playing with auto-injector demo, uh, having conversations, having drills at home. I think those are all steps to prepare and reduce anxiety. Yeah, we love when school nurses talk about drills at school and classroom drills. Uh, several have commented about that online. So valuable, right? So agreed. those practice agreed. sessions. Agreed. Yes. And, and again, it goes back to asking for help. So there are professionals who, who specialize in dealing with these situations with food allergy. So if there is a therapist who understands the food allergy and the stress related to food allergy and stress related to using epinephrine, they can be useful as well. So it's OK to ask for those help. Yes, absolutely. Ask for help and know your limits. As Dr. Jones said, when you're if you're a provider out there and treating and you know this is outside of your wheelhouse or strength, then it's time to refer, right? Um, so the next question is an interesting one. Um, have, do you find that risk tolerance changes over time? For example, the greater time that's passed since an anaphylactic reaction, that perhaps people are a little you know, less vigilant um, and, and maybe have reduced anxiety around their food allergy. I think that really depends. Um, I, I don't know if there's a consistent answer with that because it, it, it really depends on that person's experience, not only the patient and what they experience, but also the parent and, and kind of how vigilant it is. And even though in some cases, I mean, I've seen some where the child may not even remember the reaction, but yet they're just 
you know, paralyzed mentally and emotionally because the parent's been so strong for years and that, that anxiety just, it, it, in some cases may actually worsen over the years because they're getting older, they're more aware. Um, but to your point, it, it, to, in some patients, it, it, you get some distance between that reaction and then they get into teenage years where there's more risk-taking behaviors, uh, less kind of that thought process of responsibility going on. And, and so you also have those cases as well where, yeah, they may take it for granted and not think it's as serious. So that, uh, the next question is around age and time post-diagnosis. So are there certain stages or periods where you should recheck specific IgE levels um, in, in someone's food allergy journal uh, or journey, sorry? Uh, it, it's very important to know the current diagnosis. So it's absolutely useful, but it also depends on the food and the family's goal. So if it is milk, eggs, wheat, soy, statistically around between age six to seven, around 80% have a chance to outgrow. Now, how do we know they have outgrown? One of the ways is to know the previous level and see if the levels have dropped. That's when the food allergy specialist can decide whether they're ready for baked milk challenge or baked egg challenge, and also consider fresh milk challenge or fresh egg challenge. So I think sequentially knowing the numbers is helpful. It's not the only way to know. Also, if family decides just to stay with avoidance and carry epinephrine, then there's no need to continue to repeat every six months, every year. Then they can very well wait some time before repeating. So I think going back, it depends on the food, depends on the family's objective with food allergy, and uh, updated testing definitely has value. And then in your OIT patients, specifically Dr. Jones, how often are you rechecking those levels? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, when people have completed food allergy treatment, uh, for instance, are you talking about those that have finished the treatment? Well, or even or on treatment, do on you treatment? check them at any stage during that process? So we found we'll, we'll check a baseline number of tests prior to starting. I haven't actually found it useful to check in the midst of it because uh, anytime you do any kind of immunotherapy, those levels are actually going to increase. That's part of the program. But when parents see that, they panic and, and they might think, oh no, this isn't working. Uh, but it's like, you have to give it some more time. So I've, I actually don't, we don't check them during the program unless there's some extenuating circumstance, but I found it very helpful to check it after the program and then perhaps yearly uh, just to see if, you know, as they progress through. Great, thank you. So a question that was lingering from an earlier presentation that was better posed to you two is, um, why does prevalence really vary across different countries? Is it diet? Is it genetics? Is it uh, environmental factors? Yes. Why do we see such differences across the world? <laughs> yes, all, all of, of those. the above. <laughs> It really is. It's it's that combination of all of the above, and we really don't. We right. need more understanding. We don't really understand that uh, an area of research that's needed. Maybe Dr. Gupta is going to help us with <laughs> with some of that data yeah. at some point. Yeah. Right? She's got great U.S. data. Now we're going to have to force <laughs> yeah. her to go all over the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, that follow up question there was: Can allergies actually change depending on where you live or into your stage of life? Um, and, and I think Dr. Gupta addressed some of this with the adult onset, onset of food allergy, but can you also become, move from an allergy to just an intolerance? It was the question posed. Yes, so in nutshell, yes. So yesterday in one of the presentation, we had data that uh, uh, Jews in Israel versus Jews family who are in UK uh, there was a different prevalence of peanut allergy in their newborn babies. So the ethnic background or your uh, genetics could be similar, but the environment and the type of food you eat definitely defines what, you know, uh, what will happen. Similarly, as children become adults, uh, they go through changes. Certain foods you naturally outgrow, certain food allergy will persist. Uh, but intolerance is also deficiency of enzyme and that can happen with or without existing food allergy. 
and there's much higher prevalence of intolerance after one or two acute episode of diarrhea for one or the other reason. It could be food poisoning, it could be something else leads to diarrhea where you lose enzymes from the first lining of the GI tract and then you become deficient. And then when you become deficient, you're intolerant, not necessarily the food you are allergic to that you have outgrown that you become intolerant to. It could very well be altogether different food. One of the slides this morning, we saw 50% of adults uh, have new onset food allergy. Now, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate, is it food allergy or intolerance? That's why we need proper diagnosis. Any final comments from you, Sonia? Hey, before we move to our next session. No, it's great. Great, great job. Questions. Thank you, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Dr. Gia Rosenblum. All right. So um, I have the privilege of presenting the next topic which is global issues and perspectives. Um, and again, um, why am I the person that's presenting this? Because uh, five years ago, uh, Allergy and Asthma Network's board of directors allowed me to become uh, a global advocate through serving on the Global Allergy Airways Patient Platform Board of Directors, um, which I became the president of and have had the privilege now of working on global guidelines committees and with the World Health Organization on these particular topics of allergy, asthma, food allergy, and more. And so in working with 85 patient advocacy groups all over the world in this space, I've begun to understand some of the differences, not all of them, but uh, uh, many of the differences on global issues and perspectives regarding food allergy. And so today I'm gonna share a little bit about that in kind of thinking through the patient journey and the way that um, I think about how do we talk about these differences and how do we support uh, patient advocates and families all across the globe? So we've heard a lot over the last day and a half around the current state of food allergies, but I think this slide summarizes it very nicely and actually highlights some of Dr. Gupta's data that this is a major growing issue, not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, we know that in the U.S. it's 6 million children, two kids per classroom, one in 10 adults, um, but the the cost that this is causing our nation, much less other nations, $25 billion a year in the US alone, billion with a B. And so again, if you begin to look at this globally, it, it becomes astronomical numbers that we have to get a better understanding of what is going on because we're seeing that 50% increase just in the last couple of decades. And so in the time that all of this great science and some of it may be because we're better recognizing, we're doing a better job at diagnosing, but as that great science has evolved, we're still seeing such a rise in prevalence that I think now is the time that we, we bring this to the forefront and make it a priority. Also, the genetic and environmental issues, we've talked about the fact that that genetic predisposition alone really can't explain why we're seeing this increase in food allergies. And 65% and of those diagnosed, neither parent had a food allergy. So, you know, um, for me, I um, married someone who's highly atopic. We went on to have five beautiful children. And of those children, only one has food allergy. Um, I don't have food allergy. Dad had food allergy as an infant but outgrew it and so you know it's kind of odd you can't set, look at just genetics alone we know it is that uh, combination of both and then the prevention opportunity that we have is real I think that you know we've got we heard yesterday about the landmark leap study and the fact that we can reduce especially in peanut allergic families that um, peanut allergy by age five but it takes education it takes commitment it takes compliance and adherence and things that we as human beings quite honestly are not very good at on a daily basis when it comes to those disciplined behaviors I know I'm not uh, I, I shouldn't speak for everyone but I am definitely not uh, the most adherent compliant and um, you know patient when it comes to those things and then you know I think that it takes a village it takes that family care team as we've heard, but it's more than just peanuts. We've got great data on early prevention in peanuts. 
but what about all the others, right? And, and are there ways that we can look at um, those nine foods that cause greater than 90% and change our approach? Um, we can't just think about nuts only. And we heard that through the comments even yesterday, a few people saying, yeah, but what about everything else? Because there is a lot of uh, emphasis on peanut. And then we know that there are new therapies in development. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, just how quickly this space is moving forward and what the horizon may look like globally as we begin to think about new treatment options. So these are the prevalences um, across the world. The deeper the red or orange color, the higher the prevalence across the world. And what I will tell you is that you see a lot of gray on this map. And what does that mean? We don't know. So for those hundreds and hundreds that have been online with us throughout the last two days, and you know we've gotten questions from individuals in India or in Africa, um, unfortunately, we don't have great data across the world when it comes to prevalence and incidence of food allergy. And we need to do a better job at understanding what really is driving these differences across the world. And we've heard some of the data around the impact, the, the physical, the mental, the emotional health of patients affected. But I want you to stop and think if you're not food allergic, what it would be like on average three times a day to be reminded about the fear or the anxiety or the possibility of death. Think about that. Now, I just turned the big 5-0 and you start to think about, you know, things that could potentially cause the end of your life as you turn the corner to the latter half. And, and yet, I, I rarely think about those things. And, and yet, I know families that are thinking about that two or three times a day for individuals. So understanding that uh, psychosocial, emotional, physical, and mental toll, and then the, the financial toll, as we've already talked about, uh, and was mentioned uh, $4,000 per year per person in the family living with food allergy. If you're already on a stretched budget or trying to make ends meet, put a roof over your head or food on the table, and now you've got this additional concern or cost, it really can be quite overwhelming. Um, so again, some of the numbers here, 89% avoid restaurants, 82% change their family traditions to accommodate food allergies, 45% uh, are avoiding travel, and, and over 50% have skipped out on important school functions when we're talking about kids living with food allergies. So these are all reasons that we really think we, now's the time. We have to better understand and do things across the globe to address this. Um, Antonella Moraro is a, a dear, dear friend uh, from, uh, that, from Italy that actually has led a lot of the European allergy, food allergy work. And she has this great slide around food allergy burden and how it really is about understanding at an individual level what the risk is in all of these different areas, but also understanding that this landscape is changing that what was the view of allergy, food allergy, um, you know, five or 10 years ago is not the view today. So we've got increasing awareness that's absolutely bringing policy change to play in places like the UK and Ireland. We've got increasing understanding of threshold doses, and that should help us to reduce that risk and better understand the allergic reaction um, around accidental exposures of peanut and more. And then we're continuing to apprise kind of the current conditions and needs for education, for psychological support. It's one of the reasons why we developed that food allergy coach program, because we saw the increase of concern that was coming from families around these psychosocial uh, issues. And then there are new therapeutic options that are under evaluation that are coming to market and that I think we have a lot of hope to offer. So I like to think about this in the realm of going, and I've said this several times, uh, from black and white to shades of gray to full color, because that is what I think we are doing in food allergy. Um, when I was thrust into this um, 15 years ago when Carson was first uh, diagnosed, Really, it was it was pretty simple, uh, the, the instructions that we were given. So number one, when it came to food allergy diagnosis, it was specific IgE. 
We could either do that through skin prick testing or we could do that through in vitro blood testing. But that was it. That's the only option you really had to know was she sensitized to certain foods. Um, and, and again, remember, sensitization doesn't equal clinical allergy without that presence of history of reaction. So then we move into like the 2010s and you get the specific IgE and also then take it maybe to the next level of like components, right? So we talked about some of the components yesterday of the components of peanut, the components of egg, and how that diagnosis has changed from looking at the whole allergen to now the different components of an allergen. But where is this heading? And we've heard a little bit about this. We're gonna hear more uh, in the remainder of the program, but now we can actually look at epitopes. And so that next level of understanding of diagnostics across the world of how do we diagnose appropriately. And I think in the next decade, the data is gonna get stronger and stronger. Our diagnostic tools are gonna get better and better. So this is a, another slide that kind of looks at those things that are clinically available today, but then also looks at promising labs that are in development and being used in certain research centers, uh, basophil activation tests we talked about uh, yesterday as well, mast cell activation, and then bead-based epitope assays. So I think that, again, the future is bright and, and it is going to be full color spectrum in the realm of diagnosis of food allergy across the world. Now, what about management of, of food allergy? Um, again, looking back in that black and white, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, strict dietary food avoidance. That's that's all we had. Avoid, right? And, and then we kind of move into this present zone of the shades of gray. We've got baked milk and egg diets. We've got raw versus cooked plant foods, birch cross-reactive activity and nuts. We understand so much more about the nuances of these foods and the proteins and the way that we can um, you know, do elimination diets to avoid more effectively. But we still really only have avoidance and epinephrine for treatment and then a couple of treatments that I'm gonna to go to, into in just a moment. So where is this going? Like if we, again, crystal ball, look forward into the future, I think we're gonna get into a full spectrum of a personalized diet based on individual molecular profiles of sensitization. So as we understand more about what you're sensitized to, what you're allergic to, how this manifests in symptoms, then we can really tailor that dietary approach. So we've talked here about avoidance and always trying to reduce that accidental exposure, how this can really be very challenging. Um, and, and again, in the global realm, I hear from families in places like Africa um, or, or the Middle East, uh, Asia Pacific, from families who just say like, it's everywhere. I mean, I don't, there is no precautionary labeling. There's nothing. I, I have no idea. And so they really do limit their food intake to, you know, the, the whole foods that they know are safe, because that's the only thing that they could possibly um, eat and, and also afford. And then the epinephrine auto injector. And then we've already talked about some of the concerns around epinephrine. Um, it has to be on, on hand. You have to carry it. If you don't have it, you can't use it, right? It requires some training. And actually, there's data that says 7.4% of EpiPen carrying children have had to use them in the last year. And so I think that there's, you know, this concern around um, the current routes of administration of, of being in. An injection and the future is so bright in this area this is an area that um, i didn't add a slide i probably should have but we in the next year if all things go accordingly at the fda in the u.s we will have nasal sprays for epinephrine within the next two years we'll have a sublingual film that you can put under your tongue like a listerine you know breath brush uh, breath fresh breath mint, and it will save your life. That's what's coming in the space of epinephrine. And so I am very excited that we'll have trends to be able, or, or new treatment options and trends to be able to offer solutions to families that reduce that fear and anxiety around the use of epinephrine auto injectors. 
And we're working on legislative policy even now to make sure that in schools and in public spaces, we can have those new routes of administration. So one of the innovative treatments that we've heard about throughout the last two days is palforzia. So this is the only FDA approved treatment for uh, peanut allergy here in the US. Um, it is approved for patients four to 17 with a confirmed peanut diagnosis. It's used in conjunction with avoidance. It's not a cure. It doesn't mean you have, can't use, you know, don't carry your epinephrine. It doesn't mean that you can eat peanuts freely, none of that, but it does decrease the severity of the allergic reaction. And it basically is a peanut powder in a standardized format that can be sprinkled on food or, or ingested on a daily basis. And so again, Finally, we have an, a product that has gone through the FDA rigor of getting approved. And we heard some challenges to it yesterday. There's def, it's definitely not for everyone. I think you have to have a significant conversation within your home about what is your desire, what's gonna work for you and for your family before considering palforzia. Um, but it's an option and it's an option that honestly, we believe at Allergy and Asthma Network and, and GAP, every patient should have the option of understanding the risk and benefits of, of assessing that. There are some warnings and precautions um, to palforzia specifically. It can cause anaphylaxis because you are being exposed to the peanut protein that you have been allergic to. So as with any immunotherapy, that is the case. Um, and patients therefore should have injectable epinephrine on hand. They should be observed for at least 60 minutes after each dose and after updosing. And it really shouldn't be used in patients with uncontrolled asthma. And it may have some side effects and gastrointestinal effects like we've heard in the previous um, presenter slides. But again, finally, we're going from no treatment, complete black or white, to shades of gray with palforzia and also with oral immunotherapy. And so you heard me yesterday talk about approved and unapproved uh, oral immunotherapy. And I want to spend some time on this because this is happening again across the world. This is not something that's just a U.S. phenomenon where allergists are actually gradually increasing the amount of food protein consumed daily using whole foods and powders. And so the problem we've already talked about, this actually has been going on for well over a decade. Uh, even some of the experts on our panel have been doing it in their own practices for over a decade. But the first uh, food OIT really started in 2008 with a, a randomized control study. The challenges here is that it does take some time, right? You're looking at, in general, one to three years for one food allergen OIT to have its full effect. So it's a long-term commitment. You're, and you're going to have to understand that up front. It can have some side effects, um, anaphylaxis, abdominal pain. Um, there are patients who drop out who just determine this is not for me. I can't you know, get over the hurdle um, or the fear of actually ingesting the food that I've been told to avoid all of my life. Um, but again, there are options that we didn't have before. And the key here is that it, it creates that desensitization. So where your body is hyper responding uh, before and, and reacting, now that regular consumption of the offending food actually helps to desensitize your system and creates that level of tolerance, that sustained unresponsiveness, uh, again, not perhaps a total cure, because I'm not sure we're quite that far yet, um, but I think that there are still questions remaining about how long does that effect occur? Um, you know, is there a, a total loss of sensitivity if we're retesting? Do, do those numbers like completely bottom out? Are they non-existent or do they still continue to um, respond in, in the diagnostic tools. But there are options. And that's what I want you to hear is that we've moved from this binary avoid or react 
to a full color of treatment options, and it's going to increase even more so. And so these are some of the benefits. Again, desensitization in over 80% of subjects across all ages when you do oral immunotherapy. Um, remission possible, but only in a few, perhaps more durable in those younger ages. So we've seen better results there. There are some limitations. It's a slow process. There are adverse effects. Um, and it is allergen specific. And so right now, you know, again, you sort of have to tick off allergen by allergen, the thing that um, is most troublesome to you, but the opportunity. And again, this is a slide from Stanford and Kari Nado and, and uh, uh, Tina Sender, who we heard from yesterday. They do such great work, really a world-class leader in this space of food allergy at the Sean Parker Center. Center. Um, and so I think that we'll look at some of their um, um, biologic opportunities and research that's going on as we look towards the future here. But they've got over 35 studies that are going on across all ages, looking at how we can continue to really interrupt that allergic inflammatory process higher in the cascade. So I know that this is a very overwhelming slide. I always, you know, get a little nervous when I show this because it shows you all of the different antibodies and cytokines and you know um, uh, pieces and parts of the allergic inflammatory cascade that are at play. But the reason I show it is because it's important to know, number one, we're all unique and we're all different regardless of where we come from all across the world. Uh, number two, that not one thing works for everyone, right? There is not a silver bullet and one size fits all. We're going to have to tailor this approach based off of individuals. And so allergen exposures, again, we can look at the way that it's delivered, oral, sublingual, epicutaneous, um, modified allergens, immune modulators. Again, we've already looked at the way, or we'll talk about in just a moment, the way anti-IgE omalizumab is working. Um, we'll also look at the IL-4, anti-IL-4, dupilumab, dupixent, that many people have asked questions about in the chat over the last day or so. Um, and then we'll also, uh, you know, continue to look at, at, at uh, further research into interrupting that cascade higher and higher. So first, omalizumab. Zolaire is the brand name here in the U.S. It's been on the market for over 20 years. It's approved for asthma and chronic idiopathic urticaria. It is not currently approved for food allergy, so I want to make that very clear. But the research that Stanford is doing and, and the data is really growing when it comes to the use of omalizumab as an add-on treatment to those that are undergoing oral immunotherapy. And so these are all of the publications that have addressed this topic. And you can see just in the last um, you know, few years, that volume of work that's building around the benefit of using Zolaire plus OIT to get better outcomes in food allergic patients. Um, the next gen, of the anti-IgE is legalizumab, and it actually binds uh, human IgE with the 88-fold higher affinity than omalizumab, so it's a better um, molecular um, uh, tool, if you will, in the tool belt to stop that allergic cascade higher in the inflammatory process. So it blocks the binding of free IgE, and um, it actually can, you know, really Phase three clinical trials are currently underway, not approved yet, not available, but in clinical trials, we're seeing that it's having some good results as add-on treatment for OIT patients as well. Um, the uh, question that have, questions that have been posed in the chat around Dupixin, I decided to add this in later. So du Dupixin, Dupilumab is the generic name. Um, it's a human monoclonal IgE um, uh, G4 antibody for IL-4 receptor that actually inhibits that interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 binding, again, higher in the, the cascade. And when it does that, it releases all these pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and IgE. So that downstream effect is that the B cell class switches and the eosinophil recruitment um, reduces those downstream effects. And so, again, this is a, not an approved therapy. That's something that's under clinical research now and that holds a lot of promise in this space. And we do have anecdotes. This is the question that was asked yesterday. So in a patient who's on Dupixent for eczema or for asthma, do they see the benefit in food allergy? And we've got anecdotes that say yes. 
right? But we're waiting on the data to fully support that. So can we improve outcomes and side effects if we sort of do this, throw the kitchen sink at them? Stanford is doing this study now called the combined study, and it takes omalizumab plus dupilumab in those OIT patients for improved efficacy and safety. And so that's the hope, that's where we're headed. And, and again, what we wanted to share with you about kind of the, the best of the best global perspectives on the future of this. Um, so remember they're used as an adjunct to OIT. Um, it reduces those adverse events, it improves the treatment outcomes, it prevents that eosinophilia, that side effect that's often seen from OIT. Um, and perhaps it could provide an alternative to OIT that could lead to higher compliance, fewer adverse events, and maybe be less time consuming. But we don't know yet, right? The jury's still out. Um, I wanted to, for a moment, to look at global guidelines, because we talked about guidelines yesterday um, a little bit, but in the US guidelines, but we didn't talk really about global guidelines. So there was a 2022 um, working expert group, the Galen Network, the Anacare, Anaphylaxis Center's reference of it and excellence, that did a systematic review of all of the data and took a look at 39 trials, 2,200, 44 um, studies with food allergy and mainly children or, or subjects with with uh, food allergy mainly children and they looked at the data to say are these biological interventions ready for prime time right are they ready for the general population and what they found in 2022 is really question marks and sort of not yet that the data still isn't quite there. And so that's what you see here in the right hand corner when it comes to um, omalizumab monotherapy, omalizumab plus immunotherapy, and e ecotimab um, um, monotherapy as well. Now, when it comes to allergen immunotherapy, they had a different take on the global level. And so they actually recommend oral immunotherapy for um, milk, egg, peanut, tree nut um, in, in this guideline. Epicutaneous immunotherapy for peanut. So that was approved. That's the Palforzia option. It was recommended. But sublingual immunotherapy drops under the tongue or subcutaneous immunotherapy um, shots for these things still unknown safety, unknown efficacy, don't recommend, okay? Um, and so again, I think that it, it's interesting to see kind of the way guidelines are developed by expert opinion and by the science in, in the review of all the literature. So this is the summary slide for the Galen Anacare guidelines. And it says that, again, it's for primarily healthcare providers um, supporting children and adults with food allergy. And, and, you know, how did they do this? Evidence from 161 studies, experts from 18 countries, a global perspective on food allergy. And their recommendations are here. Number one, across the void, uh, across the board, we still have to avoid, right? So there's still some things in food allergy that are very black and white. <laughs> we still need to avoid. Um, but then where are some of the sort of gray areas, right? And, and how are we moving these things more and more towards green? At things like the oral immunotherapy for age four and, and up with severe food allergy, um, epicutaneous, hydro, and then the, even the, the topics around um, uh, hydrolyzed or amino acid based formulas. And, and their recommendations were not completely in favor, but they were, you know, we need more data basically around these things. So I want to talk for a moment about prevention because um, I, I spoke about diagnosis and treatment and management, but I wanted to back up and think about could we envision a full spectrum day where we prevent food allergy. And we heard a bit about this yesterday with the dual allergen exposure, which I think is a really fascinating topic and, um, you know, how we can perhaps have that early life allergen exposure through the skin and through the mouth, through the gut to prevent food allergy. And, and I'm excited about where this data will take us over the next few years. And then again, we talked about food labeling and how it matters wanted to bring to your attention again across the world wherever you're from number one not all food labeling is mandatory 
In many, many, many most countries, it's voluntary if it exists at all. The number of allergens varies. We heard this from Kyle, we heard it from Dr. Gupta. Um, anywhere from eight moving to nine in the US to 14 in the European countries. Um, South Africa has the term that you, they recommend labeling for all common and uncommon food allergens. I'm like, what is that? That is really nebulous. Uh, China has eight, but it's all voluntary. Taiwan, 11, all voluntary. So there are no government oversight or rec you know, um, regulatory requirements for packaging labeling in those countries. So in conclusion, as we wrap up on thinking about the global perspectives, um, I want it to be hopeful. I want to provide that insight of we are making progress when it comes to diagnosis, prevention, treatment of food allergy innovations. Um, this is an article that just came out this year by uh, Tina Sender and the group at, at Stanford that talks about, again, the way each of these things are evolving. And um, I would encourage you to really take a, a look at this article because I think it does a great job of bringing us from that black and white to the current shades of gray to where we hope to go full spectrum on food allergy. So my key takeaways, no longer is food allergy black and white only. Um, we have new shades of gray in prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management, and there's an opportunity here. We can have more effective prevention measures. We can have more accurate diagnostic tools. We can have more tailored treatment options. Um, as long as we always keep the patient front and center. And I think that that's the key here. And the challenge in the food allergy community globally that I have heard and that my heart breaks for is, you know, we all have different levels of risk tolerance when it comes to our own health, when it comes to our loved one's health. And we need to be respectful of that because what is Dr. Gupta's in managing her family and what is mine in managing mine versus Andrea and others in this room, it, it's different, it's unique, right? And so there is not a one size fits all and we have to continue to support patients fully along the journey and remembering that it impacts so many different areas of life. So with that, um, I will take any questions uh, regarding global perspectives on food allergy. anything in the chat okay so a question around cost um you know will these be difficult for people to access due to cost cost is definitely a concern and um, these monoclonal antibodies are very expensive um, on average they cost whatever system about three thousand dollars per month uh, so three to 4,000 per month. And so definitely it can be. How will these be appropriately interpreted if an allergist is not involved? I, I don't foresee food allergy monoclonal antibodies and OIT being done outside of an allergy specialist. I think that that is one of the major limitations that we have today. Um, and, and, and because we know access to specialty care is not universal and, and that there are some inequities along the way. So I think that that is an important question that we will have to continue to grapple with. How do we level the playing field for all patients who may not have access to a specialist? Um, what are your thoughts on direct to consumer food allergy blood testing methods, such as epitope based food allergy testing? Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to table that one and actually ask our doctors to respond to that. I think it, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, my personal opinion is buyer beware. Buyer beware. A test without appropriate interpretation is extremely dangerous extremely dangerous. I cannot tell you how many times we get calls from families that, you know, have el unnecessarily eliminated foods from the diet um, and, and really wreaked havoc on their family's life uh, unnecessarily. So a test without appropriate interpretation is dangerous. Fire beware is my, my response to that as a patient advocate. Um, could you comment on the status of the NIH outmatch study investigating the use of omalizumab as monotherapy as an adjunct therapy for patients with multiple food allergies? Again, that data is still relatively new and coming out. And I think that, you know, um, again, it, what was shown in the Galen 
is that we're not quite there yet. We omalizumab as monotherapy is not approved, has not you know met all of the endpoints necessary to move that uh, completely forward at this point. So still to be determined. Let's see. Okay, we are not able to answer a couple of these because it's direct medical advice. So I'm gonna just ask that everyone understand if we don't get to your question, it's probably because it was a too specific to a particular topic of medical offering medical advice. Okay. Should dual allergy exposure to prevent allergies be done in a hospital setting or in the community-based setting? If, um, and then it says, if we don't know if the child has allergies. So I don't know why we would be doing dual allergy exposure if we don't know that they have allergies. Yeah, are you thinking just through prevention for prevention purposes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but oh, I see the question. Now I get it in the context of that dual. Um, so, but should it be done in a hospital setting? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So, if if the child is high risk with eczema and the parental uh, genetic predisposition, that's when it's recommended to do in a hospital setting. I think is the the way the guideline reads right now. Um, okay. Good, did I miss anything for those of you that were helping me on the chat? All right. Great. Okay. All right, I think that that is the end of that session. We will continue to move forward. Um, and I am going to ask Dr. Jones to come to the podium and introduce our next speakers. Very well done. That's awesome to see the, I think even more than 35,000, you know, uh, foot perspective. So thank you so much. Uh, this next session is going to be a little unique. It'll, it's going to combine uh, Dr. Atul Shah, who you've already met, uh, along with another uh, physician, Dr. Kumar Ramlal, who I will introduce uh, briefly, and then they'll both come up and uh, talk about kind of building on what Tanya just uh, discussed uh, is kind of that innovation of moving from shades of gray into clarity and also bringing different treatment uh, approaches to patients to where it may not currently be available. So first of all, Dr. Ramlal is the founder of uh, InspiroMed Clinics. He has been a practicing pulmonary and allergy medicine doctor for over 20 years. He worked very hard to build his career, his practice from scratch, and he has developed that to where now he has seen over 70,000 unique patients. His particular expertise is in asthma and allergy uh, for both children and adults, and his clinic has been rated in the top 10% of all practices in Alberta, Canada. So he has been a, a leading um, medical special, specialist. He has presented uh, over 200 continuing medical education programs for practicing physicians uh, across North America and is recognized nationally as an outstanding educator in the field. So we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Ramlaw with us to share some of his experiences. And he definitely brings the, the credibility also from a global perspective being from an, an immigrant to Canada. So if uh, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Ramlow will come up, we'll uh, turn the time over to them. So I'm Dr. Shaw, and I'm going to invite Dr. Ramlal in a minute. Um, you know, when Tanya mentioned uh, from black and white to gray to color, I also want to bring out, even in the color, we have black and white. So patients who go through different treatment for food allergy, even during that time, uh, epinephrine and avoidance is still necessary. So black and white is included in the color. And, and uh, I think it's my perspective. Uh, at some point um, in reflection, I realized that there are so many issues, there are so many problems uh, we have a choice 
Do we be part of problem or do we part of a solution? So that's where we started working on solutions. We recognize there are so many issues in food allergy, families need to go through uh, you know, proper diagnosis, avoidance, need for epinephrine and all that. So that has led to uh, some of the work Dr. Jones and I'm doing. So that's something I would like briefly uh, to bring it to your attention that uh, some of the things we see in the color shade now with the food allergy uh, diagnostics as well as treatment are considered proven safe. They're highly rewarding. They produce results. They're life-changing. They also provide a family harmony and peace of mind. And you want to bring our why and our how to your why and your how. And that's where Allergy Asthma Network has helped Global Food Therapy to bring this to you. So I want a different perspective. If a child who has food allergy, you're living with avoidance and epinephrine, and if the treatment option, either FDA approved product or non FDA approved oral immunotherapy is available, and if you do not do OIT, what's at stake? So if you do not do OIT, you're actually denying the life changing treatment to the child and the family. You're allowing the atopic march to continue. Atopic march is where your child starts with one allergic condition, and if you do not intervene, they become more allergic or develop other conditions. Uh, you're keeping the cap on the potential. The child has so much potential, but the fear of food allergy probably holds on uh, and they, you're keeping the cap. Uh, continued social and financial burden. Uh, and also as provider, there's a patient trust issue. Uh, they're also missing out on the most impactful, satisfying and rewarding experience of life. So we know that uh, food allergy treatment does require time, money, energy, uh, but also uh, what we realize is it requires competent and passionate medical team. And in US, there are still limitations. So we can understand globally outside the United States, there are not experts who can help. So our mission has been to help physicians become food allergy experts who can help them help their patients become, uh, you know, get the proper medical diagnosis, food allergy diagnosis, but also have access to the food allergy treatment. So some of the resources we have for you and those who are online, if you want to take the screenshot, it could be useful. So American Academy of Allergy as many immunology has some resources. American College of Allergy Asthma and Immunology has resources. Allergy Asthma Network has resources. One of the FDA product for peanut is Pulphosia and the company's website has resources. FAST, which is a food allergy support team, which is a nonprofit group of uh, allergists who are doing oral immunotherapy in the United States. Their website has resources. Uh, Global Food Therapy has a, their own website, which is gft4u.org. Uh, also, OIT Connect, which is a platform for doing oral immunotherapy, uh, EMR and patient app has a website. And we also recognize many Facebook uh, communities are very useful. So in your areas or even outside United States, you can very well join uh, parents or clinician driven uh, Facebook groups. They're very, very helpful. We do believe that every food allergic child deserves freedom. Uh, these are the resources Global Food Therapy has. And uh, you know we have online community for food allergy families. And the new session will be starting in a month or two. As part of your registration for this global conference, uh, if you have agreed, then you might be enrolled. Uh, we have online training for allergists and professionals. Uh, we also have boot camp hands on A to Z training for physicians. Uh, we have trained 42 professionals in 18 United States states. Uh, we have trained allergists in Canada, Israel, Kuwait. Uh, we have 20 between Dr. Jones and myself, we have 20,000 food allergy patients and we have 4,000 plus uh, patients on oral immunotherapy for different foods. Uh, we have treated patients from eight countries and 20 states of the United States. Now, the another resource is oitconnect.com, where we have patient app 
that patients who are doing oral immunotherapy, they can use that to connect uh, you know, with their physician's medical record. Uh, we have access to resources. Uh, it can actually document the dose and the reactions. It has a notification reminder and it's a great communication tool. Now with this, um, this is the core belief which we understand from Henry Ford that coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a progress, but working together is success. And it's a true model that I would like to, uh, to invite uh, Dr. Ramlal to share his perspective on how he has taken the knowledge and resources um, and uh, getting into treating his patients in Canada. So Dr. Rampal, Ramlal, please come in. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. And I'd like to thank the AAN, the Asthma and Allergy Network for inviting me. And I start with a disclosure. And here's that disclosure. Most presenters say that's not relevant. My disclosure is very relevant. And it has to do with the fact that I'm CEO of a human behavior advisory company. And here's why that's relevant to all of you. It is relevant because I know, I believe that what you perceive, what you think, how you make decisions and how you act makes every difference to the kinds of choices that you have available to you. And that's precisely what you have done over the last two days is invest your time in changing the way you think, perhaps making some different decisions, and knowing that there might be some different steps that you can take to increase the options that you have had. Most of what you've heard about is increasing your choices, increasing your options, and that starts with each of you having some additional information, some additional learning that you can perhaps take back to your provider, and if you're a practicing physician, perhaps take back to your practice. So I've just got a few minutes and I want to talk a little bit about that patient part and then show you how that's relevant to a practicing physician, even allergist. And I look at the chat and there's both many patients and families and many physicians in this group. Um, so for, our, for our patients and their families, what we're looking for is moving from A to B. And you heard a lot about point A about that medical diagnosis, the importance of getting clarity around that. But it's not just the medicine, and it's not just IgE levels, and it's not just symptoms and anaphylaxis. What it is, is understanding how that affects your life. That psychological burden, the social burden, the other ways in which it affects all aspects of you and the people around you that becomes part of that diagnosis that defines, A, where you start. What's next is important for each of you is getting a sense of that B and recognizing that that B is different for each of us. It's different for each of our patients and it's understanding what are those individual goals that will help define the kind of care that you would seek for yourself or your families. And between A and B is a highway, right? Just run. But while it's a highway, what really matters is that it's not a race, but it is a journey. And you've heard that over the last two days. It is a journey. And if you're gonna go on a highway, one of the important things that we know is that it's important that on-ramp. How do you get onto that highway? And I'd argue that for patients, especially for their families, especially, that bit of information, that bit of learning that you've been gathering is an important part of you entering that pathway, entering that highway. And for many of you, you will be going to your physicians and asking for access to these options. And I would strongly encourage you to do that. And I recognize that the kinds of access and the kinds of options and, the, and what's available to you is gonna differ in different parts of the world. But that's the world we live in for today and we are all working to change that. Why am I doing this in food allergy? And my why is not actually around food allergy. What it is, is my son. My son, in addition to being a doc, I'm a daddy, and that's one of the most important jobs to me. My son started life with severe developmental delay and autism. He's, he was pretty beat up. And along the way, one of the things that he types in a car, that's how he spoke at that time. And one of the things that he said was, 
If this little autistic kid has got a purpose, so too does everyone else. If this little autistic kid has got a purpose, so too does everyone else. So too does each of you, whether you be a patient, a family member, a physician, so too does each of you. And there's something that was one of the lessons that he got. Here's a lesson that his daddy got, that I got. And that is that no matter what your label, no matter what crap you're facing in your life, I hope that doesn't have to be bleeped out, but no matter what it is that you're dealing with in your life, you can have a fulfilling life. Dr. Renee talked about having a fulfilling life with food allergies. Rhea Jane talked about having a fulfilling life with food allergies. And each of you has got a chance to have a fulfilling life, whatever your label, whatever that diagnosis is, and whether it ever goes away or not, does not have to limit your dreams, your goals, and where you're looking to get. So that's my message for patients. How does that A to B and highway and on-ramp apply to the physicians. And here's how that works. For many of you, as physicians, you've got to practice. Most, most people on the chat, as best as I can tell, are in private practice. I know some of you have looked up to some of you over the years. Um, and for many of you, you're not yet offering treatment options to your patients. You've had an opportunity the last two days to learn about FDA-approved and some of the non-FDA approved options for helping your patients. And I urge you to keep getting that information. What your goals are for your practice might evolve over time. What your goals for what it is that you offer to your patients might evolve over time. And that's okay, because we got to start somewhere. In my case, I recognized that it was a highway. I recognized that no, it wasn't a race. And yes, it was a journey, but I wanted to shorten my time for getting onto that highway and being able to help my patients go on and live their fulfilling life. So that's the context in which I met Dr. Atul Shah and Dr. Doug Jones and uh, how I got involved with uh, global food therapy. And basically I signed up for the full deal. I did the boot camp, and what that helped me do was access this highway of food immunotherapy more effectively, more efficiently, and I'd also argue more safely. It was important as I embarked in this process, given the fact that I was doing this in Canada where regulatory rules are a little different and funding rules are a little different. Or a lot, there, for each of your practices, there's going to be different scenarios and different circumstances for you to consider. But in my case, having access to people who have done this before, having access to giants. You know, you guys have heard from Dr. Al Shah, Dr. Doug Jones, you've heard from uh, uh, Richard um, Wasserman, you've heard from Warner Carr, Ruchi uh, Gupta is here with us. So you've heard from giants. These guys are entitled to have different ways and many more tools in their tool belt than some of us who are starting, right? That's fair. And so it is understandable that they have got a lot more gadgets true global food therapy i've been able to access their assistance and it's been very helpful to me as i've navigated some of the infrastructure that i've had to put in place to bring oral immunotherapy to my food allergy patients with that i thank you very much and thank you again for inviting me here and i'd be great to take back questions so dr ramla this was very good thank you so uh, before i ask other specific question, uh, you mentioned about your son's story. Uh, I also wanted to end with a happy note. So tell us, how is your son doing now? Well, my son, Amit, is, he's now 20 years old. And, you know, sometimes when I tell people about my kid having autism, you see their face drop. And I say, stop, wait, no sympathy yet. Because this little 20 year old kid has still got some challenges but he's the chairman and visionary behind a global consulting company. In fact, that company that I'm the CEO for is his company that I work in. And he's got clients from around the world where he leverages the things that he has learned to help himself get better. The different ways of thinking, the different kinds of perceptions that you can have, the different kinds of decisions that you can make and the different kinds of actions that you can take to help business owners from around the world. And so that's what Amit is up to. <laughs> Yeah. 
and and the, the message with that is i noticed and i was trying to be to figure out how i'd be politically correct because one of the things that this conference was about this summit was about was moving beyond fear and towards hope and i get that but you know when i hear hope what it means to me is that there's a hunger, there's a void, there's something that we are wishing for to be different, some different way in which we would like the world to be in or in which we would like to conduct our lives. And I do have one reservation and that is, is that hope is not a plan. Hope is not a plan. Yes, it is important. And I would argue it's important particularly because it reminds us of the hunger that we have, but hope is not a plan. And so you've heard some of the plans here, and I'd urge you to, you know, seek whatever it is that you have to do, whether you be a patient or whether you be a doc, do whatever it is. If it's important to you to get this done, to get a hold of a plan, and if you don't have one yourself, you can adopt one, you can buy one, you can seek it out. There are many people willing and able to help you. Thank you very much. So let's talk about plan. So what's your plan for helping food allergy families in Alberta area in Canada? So we're not the first people to bring uh, food allergy there. But you know, uh, Facebook wasn't first, MySpace was first, right? But we thought that the way in which we would do it is that we wanted a sustainable structure that would, as best as we can, deliver safe care to our patients and a structure for them to get access to support and so what we did is that in addition to me learning about it i have trained our staff built an infrastructure around this and um and yes it does cost so there are, are financial direct financial uh investments on the part of a family to do oral immunotherapy but we've decided that's the way in which we can climb on board this and bring it to our patients both the existing ones and the new ones the question that Tanya had asked Dr. Gupta that if you're a crystal ball 10 years from now where do you see uh, food allergy care moving especially in uh, Canada crystal balls are interesting things but uh, here's my thought is that meetings like this are going to make people aware are going to increase the hunger and are going to increase our patients pushing us to do more, to be more for them. And so I expect that, that there will be more demand for access to diagnostic resources, more demand for access to treatment resources. And I think that that's, that's where we're going to go. I, I believe there will be more treatment options than what we have available today. But you know what? Right now, I'm grateful to be on that on-ramp and I'm grateful to be joining that highway because this is going to be one inspiring ride over the next decade. Thank you so much, Dr. Romlal. Um, I have a question that has come up. Um, you know, oftentimes as we sit in the US, we think, well, it's because our healthcare system is so fragmented because our healthcare system is so broken, because we have 5,000 plans versus a universal plan or a socialist healthcare system. Um, your perspective is from Canada, which um, is a unique system in and of itself. Um, but can you speak to maybe just the way that different healthcare systems and, and the way in Canada, the reason why where it should be somewhat, we would think maybe a more level playing field on access to treatment, where still that may not be the case. Because I know in, in working with my friends at Food Allergy Canada and, and um, you know, the, the anaphylaxis allergy organizations, it's, there's challenges there as well. Well, if I may speak directly to oral immunotherapy, it is a level playing field. Nobody pays for it. So, so that's our level uh, playing field. And so uh, some practitioners who offer this service try to do it on the sly and do whatever they can uh, with whatever codes are able to be built. But we decided that that was not the most impactful way to go making a difference. And so we have taken the position that recognize that this is not covered, but it is an investment that we are asking our patients and families to make. And 
you know, if you look at the costs of having a person with food allergy, just in terms of dollars, it's worth that investment, we think. But if you look at the cost of your entire rest of your family and life and your future, then it's really worth it. And we are not hopeful, just to put it in perspective, uh, I was speaking to Dr. Doug Mack, a leader in Canada in the food allergy world. Neither one of us, no one else that we know of in the field is expecting that the funding agencies will cover oral immunotherapy. Yeah, that was my question. Is there anything that we can do from an advocacy perspective, from a, a professional society perspective, to advance the, um, you know, the data or the belief in this? Because I think that that's the challenge is that, unfortunately, as long as it's a private pay scenario, it creates greater gaps between the haves and the have nots. And as a patient advocate who wants equal access for all, you know, are there steps that we can take to close that? Well, you're asking me when you're the expert at this, but, but I believe that, that something like this, as I've said before, something like this where people get educated and know that this is an option. You know, so many people are still living in the first part of the black and white that you talked about, where there is avoidance and there is EpiPen if you get exposed and have a reaction. So many people don't know that there is another way. There are other ways coming. So I believe that that's one of the first steps. And then I think they, uh, you know, we live in a democratic country where votes matter. And if, if patients act up and gather together, that's most likely, I think, to make a difference. You always say, you know, never forget the power of one. And I think, uh, again, with your son's example, that is what stuck with me is the power of one person and who sets their mind to something, who determines they're going to change um, and affect their world and then the world as a, a subsequent action. So thank you so much. That was wonderful. Any other thank questions? Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we are heading into the um, last of the day, but don't want to. Miss out on this last session. So if you are online, don't leave us. Stay here with us till the very end. Um, I think you're really going to get so much out of this next session, uh, which is by one of my co moderators and hosts of the Global Food Allergy Summit, Dr. Doug Jones on holistic abundance and food allergy. And again, someone that I've had the privilege now of journeying alongside for a number of years and watching the way that his passion for helping patients is changing this space and is changing the dialogue around um, you know, how we approach individuals living with food allergy, that it's not just a one size fits all. It's not just a, this is all I'm offering and, and, and that's the way it is, or you have to leave my practice sort of thing. Um, he really does put the patients first day in, day out and considers their, their um, priorities, their goals, their aims in being their partner in managing food allergies. So Dr. Jones. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So I want to start with a story. Uh, several years ago, and, and I'd already been doing, seeing food allergy patients for a number of years. Um, I was experiencing my own health problems. And what I noticed with my own health is it was really starting to deteriorate. Um, I was starting to snowball in, in a way where one thing was added on one after the next. And as I was trying to get help for this, a lot of times it was, well, I have this one issue. Here's a, here's a, you know, a medication to treat that symptom, or here's a medication to treat the next one and the next one and the next one. But at, at the end of the day, I still wasn't getting what I really needed. And I didn't even know what I really needed at that moment. And it took a close friend of mine 
doing their own research actually, uh, reached out to uh, another practitioner and long story short, uh, I was able to get connected with this individual with no expectation whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I didn't even wanna go in the first place, but I went. And through that experience of learning from them, uh, one of the things that it taught me is I needed to open my mind. I needed to open my mind to myself and also that this one health aspect, severe asthma, for instance, I have severe asthma. So my severe asthma and, you know, the thyroid problems that I have and the migraines and the reflux and all of these are the things that I was dealing with were actually quite interconnected. And there was some undercurrents for each one of those. And it was only until I started thinking from a more kind of holistic approach to myself that I was able to move through and get some more solid answers. And even to this day, I'm still working through those types of challenges. The point of telling you this is as I was going through that as a patient, I started to think about my patients and how I was treating them. Sorry. I started thinking about how I was treating them. And if I was just addressing one thing at a time, food allergy in particular, because that's where I was spending so much of my time was with a lot of food allergy patients. And I started thinking there's gotta be a lot more to this. And instead of just treating this one thing, how is it interconnected with everything else that was going on with that, with that person? Not only with that person, but with that family. And, you know, we've had so many different beautiful, beautiful uh, presentations over the last couple of days. And hopefully with what I'm about to share in terms of how I now approach food allergy patients, I hope it kind of brings it together and ties it together. But no, this stems out of my own challenges and what, what I was going through, but then how I could try and apply that to my patients. Um, because when we look at food allergy, it's more than just food allergy. Uh, so many times when we think about data and literature and you know we've seen all kinds of data on number of hospitalizations and er visits and epipen usage and all of that it's still in the context of a person and that person has interaction with other people and that all plays a role and they are carrying a burden they have that massive burden i mean one of the questions earlier was you know do we see anxiety creating you know eating disorders in some of these patients absolutely and it wasn't really until I started getting into the realm of treating food allergy patients and seeing that burden lifted. And I didn't even realize what burden they were carrying. And I've experienced that as myself as a patient. I didn't even realize some of those burdens that I was carrying until I had somebody be my guide and be, you know, that person for me to help me kind of move past that. And that's kind of how I look at myself with food allergy patients is hopefully as, a, as that guide to just help them along and, and take their hand and say, you know what, let's do this together. You and I, let's do this together. We're a team. As it was said before, it's, it takes a community, right? Let's wrap our arms around each other and let's do this together. Um, and, and I don't think we really do realize the degree of burden that people carry until it is gone. And I love the what Dr. Ramel just said with hope and not having that plan or that roadmap. And it's like, let us be a guide. Let us throw that map down. Let's not only give you that hope, but throw a roadmap down to help you along the way. Not just being a food, you know, as a food allergy, because you're a person. We're people who happen to be dealing with not only food allergy, but everything that comes along with it, which is quite a bit. And as you see 
and approach patients in that manner, you can see personalities emerge. Children that were once, uh, that, that I used to see in my clinic that would not maintain eye contact, who would not talk, who would not smile, through the course of having that roadmap and that hope guide them along, all of a sudden you see smiles, you see conversation, you see hopes and you see dreams in them emerge that they didn't have before. And it's a truly a, a beautiful thing. When you think about food allergy and some of the factors that go into dealing with food allergy, it's, it's an unpredictable, potentially life-threatening condition. Think about those two things. If you're dealing with something on its own that's just unpredictable, that weighs on you. If you're dealing with something that's potentially life-threatening, that weighs on you. Now combine the two, potentially life-threatening and unpredictable. That's a, care, that's a serious stress and a serious weight. And that affects so many aspects of our lives, socially, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And in my realm, as I started thinking about all of this, all of this put together in, in these patients that have food allergy, not only the patients, but their families, one of the things that I took a deep dive into is how do each of these aspects affect our immune system? I'm an immunologist. So I started thinking about how do each of these aspects affect our immune system? Every single thing on this list directly impacts our immune system. And often there's a two-way street between them that I'll get into. So I wanna take this concept of going, having perhaps social stress to becoming socially fit. I kind of coined a phrase immune fitness. It's optimizing that immunity. And so with each of these stressors, we wanna take it from a stressor to this concept of fitness. So what does social fitness entail? When we talk about social stressors or social fitness, what we're really talking about is relationships. And if you look at the literature on the immune system, there is a direct bi-directional relationship between social relationships and our immune system. Our social relationships impact our immune system and our immune system impacts our social relationships. It goes in, in a circle for better or worse. And when I'm talking about um, relationships, the one that I forgot to put on this list is probably the most important one, is the relationship with yourself. You know, that relationship that you have with yourself, you have to, you know, nurture that. You've also got relationships with family and friends. Um, you may have business or school colleagues. There may be romantic or casual relationships, non-relational relationships, even pets. I think this is a big, a big deal. You know, pets are like family and they are part in, in so many ways of people's support systems. And I think that's important when you're talking about a food allergic patient, think through how all of these relationships may be affected uh, through, you know, either having the food allergy or how those, that, that support system affects the person with it. But think about, you know, having a healthy social fitness can impact that immune system. It can impact how our body is interacting with food. Mental stress. We want to take things from a mental stress to being more thoughtfully fit. What goes into this? Um, one of the thoughts that as I was putting this presentation together, I actually had this thought. It said to be more mindful instead of mindful. Think about your mind fuel. And mind fuel could come in all kinds of different varieties. Maybe the mind fuel is what stories we're telling ourselves. Uh, maybe it's our mindset or being more mindful and aware of what's happening. When we're more mindful and present in that moment, maybe we, we are able to declutter the fullness that, that kind of confuses the mind. Other types of fuel or what types of literature are we reading and looking at? If you think about society, uh, we talked about the pandemic a little bit last uh, yesterday with all the information and misinformation. We have the same thing in food allergy and food intolerance and sensitivities and these tests and all of this, this information, misinformation, you know, being aware 
being more aware and mindful instead of mindful. But these types of things um, actually also play, this stressor plays a role in our immune system. As we are able to gain better fitness mentally, then that our immunity is going to be better and stronger and more able to, again, better interact with that food. Um, all of this, by the way, not only is dealing with food allergy, but food prevention, right? Food and, and the treatment. It's all phases that we've talked about. Emotional stress. We want to go from emotional stress to emotionally fit. Emotional stress changes the relative proportion of microbes in ways that increase inflammation and activate our immune system. Inflammation increases depression and depression increases inflammation. Guess what? Another bi-directional uh, system. Think about with food allergy families, the depression, anxiety that go along with it and the inflammation that may occur and how that, you know, you get into this cycle. But when we, as, as doctors, or even if you're a, a nurse or a caregiver, uh, think about ways that perhaps you could be more emotionally fit to help guide uh, those people with food allergies in that, in that kind of system. We can work on relaxation and social support of love and intimacy to restore a more healthy balance, and it even gets down to the microbiome level. The microbiome, what I'm talking about, which has been mentioned several times, is not only in the gut, but perhaps even on the skin. There is a, a gut-skin connection when we talk about this dual allergen hypothesis, right? So many times what we see manifesting on the skin may be driven by what's going on more internally in that microbiome uh, that, that's happening within the gut. If you think about it, the gut is actually the skin wrapped around, right? Your skin is a continuum all the way through down the GI tract. So we, we can gain some clues there. And if you think with this, let's just take the dual allergen hypothesis, for instance, what if we were able to implement measures to become more mentally, emotionally fit that decrease that stress and inflammation in the gut? How would that affect the skin? There's an absolute connection there. Something that I think needs a lot more attention and research uh, and would love to see more people get into that. Um, when we talk about physical stress, I, I often like to say uh, when we focus on our fuel activity, rest and recovery, it can help you go far, a little acronym. Uh, those types of things, what kind of fuel are we putting in to our bodies? What kind of activity are we doing? And are we getting proper rest and recovery? All of that plays directly into the immune system. And when you think about food allergies in particular, or food intolerances, so many times people will have to do, you know, avoidance diets. And unfortunately, as Tanya just mentioned earlier, you know, you do certain tests without proper interpretation, you may be unnecessarily avoiding certain foods that can lead to um, calorie and nutrient deficiencies. Um, that, that also kind of play a role. It can limit kind of that diversity within the gut microbiome. And um, so, so we, this all plays a role. Uh, there's a, there's a, a world-renowned doctor, his name is Dr. Daniel Amen. And he, I was listening to a podcast and he had a beautiful quote and he, and he was talking about feeding our, our bodies and our minds. And he basically said, love the food that loves you. Well, I started thinking about that quote, love the food that loves you. And I said, what about food allergic families? What about, what about them where they may love the food, but that food certainly doesn't love them, it does not love them back, right? And so I thought, as we try to help as practitioners, what part of my job is to help optimize that immunity and shift that immunity to help that food love the person again. And, and so they can, we can love the food that loves them. But if that's not the case, perhaps we can shift that. One aspect that I think uh, we should kind of pay attention to, no matter what your background, no matter what your belief system is, there's definitely evidence to support uh, from an immune standpoint 
uh, taking time in, in silence, or some people may call it meditation, prayer, whatever that is to connect. And the other thing that I like to think about in this realm, when you're able to take some time to yourself to either connect with yourself or to, to something larger, realize that we are a part of something bigger. No matter what the belief system is, we are part of something bigger. And as we take those few moments in, in meditation or silence or, or prayer, whatever your belief system is, that works and that plays into, again, that immunity. Even if it comes down to just breath work, taking time, just focusing on that, that breath, proven relaxation techniques out of, out of Harvard, actually, you know, where proven techniques to just create that relaxation, it can shift and optimize that immunity. As we do that, you know, as we optimize our immune kind of transformation, that's my new acronym for OIT, is when, if you look at the, the diagram on the, on the uh, left, it's kind of a, a picture of what happens when people, when we're able to transform an immune system so that once was life threatening to a person, they can now tolerate, and even perhaps in a lot of cases consume uh, as much as they want. That's kind of a diagram of what we do. It's this stepwise incremental building over time, slowly day by day, week by week building you know, until we're able to achieve a certain point where we've shifted that immunity in a positive way. When you think about your kind of working on your, your social relationships, mental fitness, emotional fitness, physical fitness, sometimes that can be so overwhelming. You think, where do I even start? Where do I even start? The journey of a thousand steps begins with that single step, right? You have to start somewhere. And you have to have that map and what we want to do is just take that and step at a time as we integrate all of these things put together because guess what these all play a role in food allergy in one way or the other whether it's on the prevention you know whether it's development prevention treatment or anywhere along the way the social mental all of that play a role in that microbiome in our immune system and inflammation and how we are approaching life. And, and I think moving forward, you know, as Tony even mentioned, moving forward with specific diets, you know, tests that are based off great test results, that we may be able to tailor those things. As we move forward in life, I think we need to keep that picture in mind that we are just not one little component. We're a bunch of parts put together you know, as a unit and as a person, even a soul. And um, hopefully this kind of ties a lot of things together with what we've talked about over the last few days and moving forward and providing a roadmap. Um, if you have questions or want more information on, you know, how can we realistically take some of those steps, you know, one step at a time, feel free to email. Uh, like Tanya said at the beginning, that's that's a difference in this conference. We want to make ourselves available, make ourselves um, accessible to, to each of you so that we can um, work together and, and be that community supporting each other. And with that, I'll end my comments. I am going to make one last thing that please, please remember to fill out your online evaluation because this helps provide us some guidance in future planning, future summits, so that we can really tailor the information that's most beneficial for each of you. And uh, so please do that evaluation. We read those, we take those into account, and it really will help guide us so that we can be a better guide for you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. So we do have a number of questions. I'm gonna ask Dr. Shaw to join you at the podium because as we have our final sort of um, last few moments together here, we want to encourage all of our online participants in the room. If you've got questions, please go ahead, put those in the chat. We're going to get to as many of those as possible in the time we have remaining. Some have come in, and so I think, again, the way we worked this before worked well, so we'll continue to do that. Um, so first off, um, speak to your beliefs around the direct consumer intolerance test 
that are currently on the market, food intolerance test. Um, do you find those of value? Do you encourage patients to use them or no? Let me take that. So those have not been validated. They're, they're non-validated tests and many of them will, I can't speak to all of them, but most of the time or many of those tests are checking like an antibody called IgG. And they, they will often claim that, that uh, if you're making that antibody that you may have, that that, that signifies a food sensitivity or, or intolerance. But that's actually has not been proven or shown. In fact, when we do food allergy treatment, if anything, we're seeing as patients are getting tolerance to that food, those IgGs are increasing beneficially. And so I would be just, just like you said, Tanya, you know, buyer beware. Uh, I would be really cautious of those. Um, know that they just have not been validated nor substantiated. And so I'd be really cautious as you're using those and, and perhaps discuss that with your doctor. I agree. That's kind of our advice from the network as well. Um, Dr. Shaw, what about fecal transplant for food allergy? And explain maybe what that is, because we haven't talked too much about it. We're not doing OIT for that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not doing OIT yeah, for that. Yes, very, very well said. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, new knowledge about uh, microbiome and gut flora. So one of the hypotheses or theory is if you can readjust the gut flora, maybe it will help with either food allergy prevention or with food allergy treatment. Nothing has been concrete, so I'm just going to wait and see what data will show. Uh, there are better ways to do things, and I think I'll stick to better way to do things at this point. Yes, is there any additional comments? No, we'll just... I would love to see the sheer decision making process on that <laughs> consideration, right. quite honestly. I'm not sure that people will, will be uh, totally game for that, but there is some research going on and I think we'll wait and see what the data has to show. All right, next question. Can oral immunotherapy interrupt the atopic march? And if so, what is the data to support that? And maybe give a little bit of background about atopic march yeah. just for anyone who so knows so for families who are here atopic march simply means an infant will start with one allergic condition and over time will develop more allergic conditions uh, atopy is also associated with higher ige for individual allergen so the environmental allergy we have enough science to support a child who is allergic to dust mite and if you do not do anything over time may become allergic to grass pollen tree pollen dog dander cat dander and some form of immunotherapy if it's done while they're allergic to only one allergen we call monosensitization you can prevent them from becoming allergic to more things and also if they have only allergic rhinitis to dust mite and if you intervene you can actually do primary prevention of allergic asthma so if you apply that model to food allergy space, maybe it's possible. Uh, for example, child who is allergic to one food, and if nothing is done, many children over time can become allergic to other foods. So the question and the things that we need to collect data on is if a child who is allergic to one food, and if you intervene by doing oral immunotherapy, is there any way to prevent them from becoming allergic to more foods? And the time will tell. I mean, anecdotally, we've we've yes, seen yeah, this. That's good. Yeah, happen. anecdotally, we we have seen this, you know, alter that atopic march, but it would be great to see that in a formal study. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we talk about this also in asthma, right? That um, if we could intervene, perhaps in the first five years of life, mm -hmm. and and interrupt that atopic march when it comes to food allergy, environmental allergy, eczema, if we can sort of halt those things. Does it then set the child up for a better life overall and perhaps keep them from going on to develop asthma? I think the data, it, you know, anecdotally, we've got some data. Uh, we've got some stories we've heard from families, the difference this makes, but we need the data in, in the literature and the peer review literature 
to make the case because I think that just as we were talking about in Canada, I like what's going to make the, the case to get this reimbursed. Perhaps that's it. If we could change the course of a child's life by intervening in the first five years in these ways. Wow. I mean, we could save families at least $4,000 per person per month, right? Uh, that becomes a, a when I when we talk to policymakers, I often say, and one of the questions that came in is like, how do we advocate? How can we become the best advocate? It's you have to build a story, right? You have to build a story around emotion, and we all have a heart, even policymakers. So how do we connect with the heart, right, through emotion, and telling our story, our why? How do we tell the evidence, the scientific evidence to support our position? And then how do we build the economic case that this makes sense for the system? So that's the way that we advocate at the network. And that's how we train you to advocate at the network is by building your story around those three E's of emotion, evidence, and economics, and then driving towards that policy change that you want to see or be. Um, all right, next question is OIT protocols. Are there differences for hospital setting versus community-based office setting? Um, I think a majority of the oral immunotherapy is more community-based at this time. I don't, I'm not really aware of a lot of hospital-based is I don't think it's necessary. Um, so, but even amongst the community, th there are some differences between, subtle differences between protocols. So in one of my other roles in life, uh, it's, I'm president of what's called the Food Allergy Support Team. We're a nonprofit organization, uh, allergists, board certified allergists that are interested mainly in educating other allergists on kind of best practices of OIT. And one of my great colleagues who was a speaker uh, yesterday, Dr. Richard Wasserman, one of the comments that he made in one of our training sessions as we talk about different protocols, is he said, there are some, some subtle variations and, and differences in how you do OIT. And one, then they all may be right, but you know, our purpose is to help people not do it wrong, you know, to stay away from kind of doing it wrong. And we even see this kind of similarly with um, allergy shots, for instance, you know, when you're doing any kind of immunotherapy to trees, grass, weeds, dust mites, allergists are going to have subtle variations. And there's different, there's kind of that range of doing it right, but there's definitely bounds of doing it wrong. And so as people look around, there will be some subtle variations in protocols um, most of the time that's okay, but we do want to stay within that, those bounds. Yeah, I think that, and that has been the criticism, if you will, of non FDA approved oral immunotherapy is sure. that there's lack of standardization. There's lack of clear protocols. And, and I think that's the, the benefit of what you're doing at Global Food Therapy, but also the FAST group is doing yeah. um, and some of those trusted resources to get the appropriate training. If you're going to do this, and, and, you know, and, and again, buyer beware to patients that you're seeing a provider that is using a standardized protocol mm -hmm. that has experience that you're not their first rodeo, For if sure. you will. Yeah. All right, um, let's see. So next question, how do you handle food allergy treatment in people with brittle asthma? So um, as per yesterday's presentation, uh, it's absolutely essential to control all allergic conditions fully before you do any form of oral immunotherapy. So asthma has to be well managed, including normalization of uh, lung function, we call FEV1. So that is absolutely necessary. It may take a few weeks to a few months to get it in control. There are many options from avoidance to proper medications to biological products, if needed, to get the asthma under control. It's absolutely needed. And once asthma is well controlled, and uh, when the beauty of oral immunotherapy is the physician doing oral immunotherapy also sees the patient often, either once a week or once every two weeks. So it's easy to manage changes that are happening in asthma. So you can be proactive in managing asthma. And, and that, so, 
best approach is to get the asthma under control like any other patient and then consider OIT. Focus on the asthma first, get it under controlled, and then yeah, and move forward from avoidance alone on the food allergy. Yeah. Um, next question. So what are your thoughts for new moms, young moms that are starting to introduce allergens? Is it necessary to wait the three to five days in adding foods to the diet to see if a reaction occurs? So that's a good question. And to some degree, that, that may be something that they need to talk to their doctor about in terms of, you know, depending on that child's history and, and risk factors. Um, but, but in general, you do want to give j just in general, you know, if they're, if they're doing that, you do want to give a few days, you know, between, because if you start adding too many variables and something goes wrong, you need to know where you were at, right? What step kind of went wrong. So yeah, you want to give enough time that, that you're comfortable that, okay, we're, we're, that my child's not going to react here. We can move on to the next one. Yeah. And, and. Um, I think that this is an important point because the other thing is to introduce it multiple times within that period, right? Not just one and done because of the way that allergy works. So maybe explain that a little bit to those new moms. Like it's not always the first exposure that drives the response. Right. Yeah. So sometimes uh, it may take some time, you know, first of all, when you're introducing a new food, you have to, your, your body may be seeing it for the first time. And it may not react because it takes some time to get what we call sensitized. And then it's those subsequent exposures actually that may lead to that allergic reaction. And so you do need to have it in the diet, you know, not just once, but multiple times to, to give your body that time to that if it's going to get sensitized, it gets sensitized. And then, you know, you have that reaction. But again, you don't want to be confounding that by adding something too quickly uh, that now you don't know what they're reacting to. Right. And so this is a follow up question to that. And, and I think it, it comes along the topic of dual exposure. Would it be appropriate or considerable to rub the food on the skin and the lips or ingest the food as well? I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes we've seen more people get sensitized that way uh, just because it, it, I think it's better to introduce it through the GI tract where you have that process of digestion first. Um, I think that gives the, the, the child or the patient a little better chance of being able to tolerate that food because what's happening on the skin may be different than what, what's happening in the GI tract. Right, great. Any other questions from our online community? Keep them coming in. I think we are getting through the vast majority of them. Can I give a little side note to that yeah. last answer? Yeah. So one interesting phenomenon is when people, I will have people at times who have successfully completed oral immunotherapy. And when I say successful, I mean, you know, we've taken them from it being potentially life threatening to now they can consume that food orally in as much abundance as they want. Uh, but then I've had some where they've had a different route of exposure. Like for instance, I had a patient who was completely done with milk. They had, they had finished the milk protocol. They were drinking gallons of milk by the day. One day it splashed and it got in his eye. It splashed in there and it was a different route uh, because he was careless with how he was drinking it and he had a straw splashed his eye and he actually developed hives and um, wheezing within minutes because of that different route. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I could think about that in that topic of rubbing the food mm -hmm. on the child. Sometimes we hear stories of like contact dermatitis of yeah. like a, them breaking out right. in itchy hives and rash from mm -hmm. rubbing food on the skin rather than so. But one more time, explain dual exposure, because I think that they, there may be people joining us that didn't fully understand that definition. D dual exposure is just kind of that concept of initially we thought the only way people would ever get sensitized or, or develop an allergy to a food is by eating it, by consuming it. And for, for years, actually, we would have patients come in and say, my child just reacted to peanut, but I swear that's the first time they've ever had it. They've never had it before. How can this be? 
Um, but what we're learning more and more is you can also develop allergies through a second route of exposure, most commonly the skin, uh, where with eczema in particular, where you don't have an intact skin barrier. What happens with eczema is that skin cracks, it dries, it's red, it's inflamed, and it's an entry point for allergens. And, and so if there are food proteins somewhere like in the dust, for instance, or uh, some other method, you could get develop the allergy through the skin, a second or dual allergen exposure. So mouth and skin. Thank you, very helpful. All right, I think that is the end of our uh, questions. I'm gonna, the three of us stand together for the next session. Um, so we are coming close to the end of our time together. But I wanna talk a little bit about some of the trusted resources that we know are available out there for our community. And you've heard about them throughout our time together. Um, things like the Global Food Therapy and their website, the FAST group and their website. So if you're a provider looking into doing these things, connect with these groups, make sure that you've got access to good quality, science-based, evidence-based approaches to offering this in your clinic. Uh, for patients, for families that are out there, please remember that Allergy and Asthma Network is here to walk with you alongside the journey. We have a host of free downloads from understanding anaphylaxis to dining out safely to uh, epinephrine treatment option posters, you know, a wealth of resources to help walk you through the journey. As I said, we've got our food allergy coach program, our food allergy coaches that are here to help you in that regard. And so definitely don't forget that we are here not just today, not just yesterday with the Global Food Allergy Summit, but every day to support you in that journey. Um, there are other organizations that have great resources like the Food Allergy Research and Education Fair, FACT, um, AFA. We heard from uh, Kyle Dine on Equal Eats. There are so, this is one of the things that I look back and I think, again, five years ago, 10 years ago, there just weren't that many trusted resources for our community. And yet today they're in abundance. And so I'm so thankful for the way that we have progressed. Um, any other topics or, or trusted resources that you guys wanna close before I make some closing comments? All good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. All right. <clears throat> well, as we come to the close, there have been some things that I walk away um, just thoughtful about, mindful about. And, and I, I think that the thought of hope without a plan, I was thinking about that. Hope without a plan, from my experience of working alongside families, only leads to frustration. Because we need a plan, right? We need not only to know that there are options, not only to know that there is evolution in the space, but that there is a plan for me personally to access it, for my family to be impacted and changed. So hope without a plan probably leads to frustration. And I think that was a really valid point that was made this afternoon. But hope with a plan leads to empowerment. And I honestly believe that that is what the last two days have been. It's providing you with the, and equipping you with the information, the education that's necessary to be empowered. To not feel like you've been given a life sentence or a death sentence of living with food allergies, but to be actually feeding I felt like that last session, it was almost a super soul Sunday moment. <laughs> if you know about those, it's, it's that super, and that's where I leave this afternoon. On this Sunday afternoon, I leave with my soul fed, knowing that we have done our job of providing that hope with a plan, providing the education, the information to empower our community to live fully and to not be limited by food allergies. You know, sometimes we get caught in the gap mindset of what the ideal is, what should be, what could be, looking at the, what the, you know, the perfect scenario. 
But I want us for just a moment this afternoon to think about the gain mindset, the progress that we have made. Looking back, always measuring back, thinking about how far we've come, certainly continuing to strive forward. Anyone who knows me online or in this room absolutely knows I don't rest until we continue to strive forward towards that day where there is a cure, towards that day where no family has to live with this. But in the interim, remember you're part of something bigger. We heard that to this afternoon. You're part of a community, you're part of a plan, you're part of the process of continuing to make significant progress in food allergy. And so on behalf of Global Food Therapy, on behalf of our sponsors, um, who again, I want to thank, on behalf of Allergy and Asthma Network and GAP, um, thank you for entrusting us with your time. Thank you for those who have provided their experience, their expertise, and their why, their passion. Because at the end of the day, it is the why behind the what we do that really matters. And together, we can affect the world. One of us may be our world, but together, the world. And so I look forward to seeing you all again and appreciate your time at the Global Food Allergy Summit 2022. Thank you.